I guess we could still, if there is, um, like for the live audience, I guess I can still make pieces. Oh, wait, we're back. Are we back? I think we're back. Yeah, we're back. Okay. I didn't even have to like restart the stream. That's, yeah, curious. Okay, sorry, sorry about, about that, guys. That. <laughs> no idea what happened, if it was our fault, or maybe there's like a shuttle launching nearby and uh, why it took up too much bandwidth or something. Who knows? Yeah, I don't know. Kind of a weird hiccup. Um, okay, so I was just explaining, trying to explain the nuances in this variation, uh, where white plays bishop e3, reinforcing the center, reinforcing d4, but leaving e4 undefended. Mm -hmm. obstructing the rook from defending the e4 pawn. And at first glance, it looks like... Free pawn. Free pawn. Knight takes e4. Um, however, there's something terribly wrong with this move. If you really want to try and find the tactic for white, and you don't see it right away, is it proper to tell people to pause a live stream? Maybe. Um. Or you can, like cover your ears or something. They can pause it, yeah, but, but the experience isn't so great. That's true. If this like... ends up on YouTube and you're watching on YouTube, pause the video, find the best move for white. Um, best move here is bishop d5. Simple Oof. fork. Wow. Both knights undefended. This is why you have to be very careful leaving undefended pieces out in the open, especially early in the game where there could be opening traps. Um, so the e4 pawn, at least for the time being, is untakeable. And uh, with bishop e3, white staying a, a bit flexible, um, first developing the bishop, preparing to play knight bd2, and complete development. Um, now, a few more moves have been played. And actually, if you close the door, it locks. So you might want to prop the door open, if possible, now that there's no yeah. more like, is, moving of, of furniture outside. Sound is gone, yeah. Um, so let's see what was played. E takes d4, takes d4. And then, okay, from my experience, there's actually two main moves here for black, uh, very different approaches. There's knight a5, mm -hmm. which is what pl was played in the game, which uh, is very logical, just going after the bishop pair. And if white were to play bishop c2, there's knight c4, going after the other bishop right. and uh, having a nice square for the knight. I think this is usually what happens, and then white just goes like bishop c1. Bishop c1. Yeah, it looks weird because you like you develop your bishop and now you're moving back. Right. But the knight on c4 could actually be a way to gain time. For example, b3, bishop b2 ideas, and um, in some sense, both sides are losing time. Yeah, but if white can get these two bishops on b2 and c2, and then gets knight d2 out, it can be a really dangerous setup, then you get e5 ideas sure. and everything just opens up against the king's side. So usually black will play c5 mm -hmm. um, to keep some initiative, try and get rid of the, the pawn on d4. And if white plays a move like d5, it gives away the e5 square, allowing knight e5 and the knight, like if knight's chased away to e5, then black is still pretty happy. Yeah. Um, going back to this position, just to show the other idea, for black is d5 right away, um, going for control over the, the e4 square. And the main line here is pawn e5, knight e4. And this is a very playable approach for black. Um, I remember looking deeply into this line and then being inspired to play this whole variation because of one game um, between Ponomaryov and Olyanov. Oh. Um, and I found it here in the Masters database. I want to show people, like, if you do want to analyze this game on your own, um, I'm going to switch to full screen here. Um, you see it right here in the Masters database. We can click it. Um, and for this sake, we can insert it. It brings the whole game in as a new variation. And just to show really cool, a deep opening idea from this variation, h3, bishop h5. Knight bd2, so far normal looking moves. Takes, takes. Now bishop takes f3. Looks like white's in some trouble because there's bishop b4 ideas looming. Um, but there's incredible move in this position. I think several years ago is novelty. It could have been novelty in this game. Mm -hmm. um, moving queen c3. Yeah, this one. Um, I actually first discovered this move, not from this game, but actually I was sitting next to 
Jeffrey Zhang playing Andrew Tang, the last round of like a Philly Open many years ago. Jeffrey Zhang like won in like 20 to 25 moves. Yeah, he's, he's played Quincy this line three. a few times. Um, yeah, and it's actually like, it's really difficult for black once you start digging into it as both the knight and the bishop are hanging. And there's lines where if black goes for bishop to b4, white's happy just to take on c6, sack the exchange, win the pawn on d5. Um, so sometimes when you see an idea or a game featuring a move like this, it will inspire you to like kind of just play the whole opening. Yeah, it's definitely one of the weirdest opening ideas I've seen. It's like yeah. Black took a piece on f3, and we play queen c3, like stepping into a skewer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, it's just like a messy position. But the, the computer supports this, and many variations, white goes down material, but has like very good structure yeah. and good position for the bishop pair as well. Yeah, Stockfish says it's OK, so yeah. people uh, make it work. So anyway, let's go back because um, they went for the, the knight a5 line. Um, White's turn here would expect bishop c2, um, but I'm expecting just a, of a long positional battle. Um, and we should also note that there's a, a pretty big rating differential in this game. Hungaski, Grandmaster, mm -hmm. rated 25.53. Uh, Martin Hansen, rated 22.25. Um, so it'd be a great result for White if he can manage uh, to draw or win the game. Um, but certainly a tall task ahead, and I think Hungaski should be pleased with opening where it's already beginning to look imbalanced, especially with c5, knight c4 coming. White will be under some, some early pressure. Yeah. Well, a lot of fights still left in this game, mm -hmm. that's for sure. Um, yeah, the answer to the question from Mar598, White probably won't want to allow black to take on b3 and uh, knight a5 is on the board right um yeah so it's actually funny because i i worked on this opening i think for a few days like leading up to a tournament and if i remember my preparation correctly i plan to go for a variation where i do allow knight takes b3 hmm. um i don't remember the exact idea i think the idea is knight bd2 to allow knight takes b3, a takes b3. I remember some crazy idea with c5 and then h3, like ending up playing h3 and g4. Wow, g4. And I really wish, I like I remembered the exact line. This was years ago. Um, but it was, it was all approved by the computer. And um, if we play this out, wonder if Stockfish can give me some, or at least jog some memory a little bit. Yeah, to play this move knight h4. Um, maybe this will give like some inspiration to the viewers to just kind of show what extent I prepare openings, like how deeply I just don't stop after the pieces are developed. I, I go very deep to try and find concrete ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and knight h4 looks like a very strange move because it, it puts a knight on the diagonal of the, the queen bishop battery and the knight's not defended. On top of that, the pawn on e4 is not defended. Um, but I remember Sockfish giving like a very slight edge for white and there being like multiple traps here where if black takes on e4 with either piece, I believe it's a blunder, like if bishop takes, let's start with knight takes e4, then white just can take on g6 and win the knight. Um, and if bishop takes e4, there's pawn g5 winning material. Mm -hmm. um, in the meantime, there's ideas of knight f5, there's ideas of f4, f5. So it's a cool, yeah, it's like cool uh, variation. Almost like a caveman style approach, mm -hmm. just trying to run the f-pawn, breaking a lot of positional rules. I mean, giving up the bishop, opening up the king, but, um, you know, the center is open, but, yeah. you know, if it, if it puts pressure on the opponent, there's a lot of things that can that can work in chess, I think. And especially when you're like backed with engine preparation, it can be dangerous. Yeah. Like going into this position as black with no knowledge and having to come up with moves on your own. Mm -hmm. um, so let's. Uh, do you have a question? Oh yeah, let's. Um, so I, I've switched scenes to uh, to show the whole window, but we should go back and make sure people can see our beautiful faces. Um, thanks for that. Um, no yeah, let's Somehow let's no on. one in the chat seemed to mind not to. <laughs> <laughs> so 
so we have like different scenes for the the stream. So this is kind of the main main scene with the the board and the webcam. Nice. Then we have the full screen. We also have um, the scene specifically for standings. Oh, we have this scene too. Which what did I just do? There we go. Didn't want to mess around there. Um, it should still be okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> Anyway, um, let's continue with more yeah, developments we have in the games. Two games that we haven't looked at yet. Bless you. So we could check out check out board nine. Uh, uh, just still in the opening phase. Carol Khan, advanced variation. This is another opening. I play with neither side. I've seen games in though. Like I'm, I'm aware of of games in the structure. Do you have any experience? Not much. Not much. But, you know, I understand some things about mm -hmm. chess. Black gets uh, kind of a French. The bishop got out. It's a French structure with a good bishop, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's confusing why this isn't just, like, great for black. Because it's, like, an advanced French. The bishop, normally, like, for for the French bishop to get to this diagonal, it's, like, an absolute miracle. I mean, it has to go through, like, d7, a4, c2. And just, I mean, it happens, but it's it's very, very difficult. Or e8, g6, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, here it seems like okay, Black has solved a lot like his biggest issue so far. But I, the drawback is okay now the bishop can be missed on the queen side. So when White plays a4, a5, c4 can put pressure, uh, and it, Black has made a lot of pawn moves. So White has some some small lead in development here that they can work with. Yeah, and also the sometimes the bishop on f5 is a target. Like the, there are lines where White plays g4, h4, tries yeah. to trap the bishop. Absolutely. Um, in some positions, maybe knight h4 and, and go for the, the f pawn thrust. Um, also, black is uh, a move slower to play c5, which has already played c6, mm -hmm. which is also different uh, uh, compared to the French. But usually, if black can co consolidate and um, not run into like too many early problems, then then it is nice, like positionally, to have your bishop on on a nice diagonal. Yeah, we'll see what Fernandez. Um comes up here. We have a funny comment in the chat from Defrox Frank saying Fernandez was my middle school classmate. And I'm sure there's there has to be people watching who who know these players. Yeah. And I will say that if um, if there's any player that or, or game that you want us to cover specifically or in more depth, mm -hmm. or if you have questions about the games, yeah, let us know, guys. Uh, make your voice heard in the Twitch chat. Um, this goes to the live audience too. If you guys have questions, just Shot them out. Well, I'm, I'm partial to the games that you are already covering. Martin Hansen, a friend of mine, and Dan Fernandez. So you know these players. Nice. Oh, nice, nice. Cool. Um, so yeah, hopefully we'll have some more excitement because the, the openings are kind of un, unwinding very slowly. Yeah. And especially with the delay, if players start taking their time, um, there won't be the, the fireworks that we like to see so soon. People are slowly getting into it, yeah. getting into the battle. I mean, the, the round started around 7 p.m. It's currently 8.20 p.m. local time here in Orlando, Florida. Good question from Mar598. What's the price pool like this year for the U.S. Open? Uh, I believe there's um, quite a big uh, price pool. You, we can see Mubot there with the link. Thanks, Mubot. Um, I think the total is something like 50,000 uh, divided among different uh, different sections and classes. First place is something like $8,000, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, second actually, is 4,000. Yeah, it looks like a 50,000 projected prize fund with $8,000 first prize, which is uh, pretty nice if anyone can take clear first. Yeah, and $200 to anyone who wins clear first as mm -hmm. a bonus prize, which is let's say nothing compared to the ticket to the US championship that they would win, that's but true. that's a nice bonus. <laughs> yeah, if you make it to US championship, that's at least a guaranteed like few thousand dollars. Yeah. You're the last place at US championship exactly. is like three or four thousand dollars. Basically guaranteed second so. second prize in this tournament. Yeah, yeah. question? Did you guys go into a little detail? Did you mention that the winner gets a qualifier for the US championship? Yeah. What are some other ways that players can qualify and do mm -hmm. any of the GMs? That's a good question. And just to repeat that for the online audience who may not have heard, um, question is how 
how are other ways grandmasters qualify for US championship and and does the US Open actually like incentivize players to come to to try and get that coveted spot? Yeah. I mean basically the the system does change from from year to year. So uh, usually there's something like 12 spots available. Uh, one goes to the previous champion. Uh, a certain number go uh, based on rating. It can be like six or eight slots. Um, one goes to the winner usually of the uh, U.S. Junior Championship, though in recent years they, they haven't always done this. They sometimes give a slot to um, the, the uh, U.S. Senior Champion as well, U.S. Open Champion, and uh, maybe one uh, wild card slot, which they'll give either to a junior or the, the highest rated player not, not invited through, through other means. Um, so basically, if you're not one of the top 10 players in the U.S. and you're going to get a, a spot by rating, the U.S. Open is kind of your, your only chance. So I think a lot of GMs do come here specifically with the, the goal of winning um, because first place is not only a nice prize, but it, again, it's this ticket to this U.S. Championship, which is... Uh, it's almost like a Canada's tournament. It's like, so exactly. Yeah, I think um, at least for us, that would be the the easiest way to get to the <laughs> U.S. Championship is to win the U.S. Open. Um, but it's yeah. not an easy feat, and it's it's getting more competitive every year to qualify for U.S. Championships, which is so many young players emerging. And um, I mean, there's there's so many grandmasters in the U.S. who are strong players, but just don't make it. But to the U.S. Championships, there have been um, international masters who have won the tournament in recent years. Uh, Enrico Seviano, who mm -hmm. now is a GM, but at the time was a very strong IM. He won. I think John Daniel Bryan also won one mm -hmm. year, um, and, and he's an international master. And it was very cool to see him playing the U.S. Championship the next year against like all of the the top players. Uh, so it does happen that it's like an outsider, but. I think last few years it's been people like Gurea, Lenderman, so super, super strong GMs that, that are winning the tournament. Mm -hmm. So um, let's uh, let's continue with the games. There's one game that we haven't looked at between two players who um, I know of. Uh, the game between Vyam Vidyarthi and Bryce Tiglan. Um, actually, I don't know if this is the best game to, yeah, not many to look moves. at because um, <laughs> I mean, move two and uh, there's some delay. Could be some issue with the DGT. Could be a DGT error. Yeah, at this the point. Chess Live. Several moves. Several oh. moves. Hmm. Let's check. So US Chess Live. Yeah, I can. Maybe you can bring it up on on your screen. Yeah, absolutely. And I can feed you. And we the can moves. feed the moves. Um, I do want to bring up that uh, there was a a side event this morning. It was a U.S. Open tennis um, for chess players. And uh, there was a turnout of about eight players, and Viam was, was one of them. And there was a lot of doubles action. I played a few games on his team in doubles. And um, he's a pretty good tennis player, for, especially for his age. Nice. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, he also won a recent National Scholastic event in Nashville, um, yeah, either the K5 or the K6. It's quite possible, yeah. Um, so, yeah, Vyom is he's from the uh, the Bay Area. So he, he's a really talented junior for his age. I think he's maybe 11 or 12 years old. Uh, his younger sister, though, Omiya, is even even more accomplished. Mm -hmm. She's like a multiple time like Pan American champion. Uh, and actually, very this, strong for her age. Yeah, yeah, in the same event in Nashville, she won the K3 mm -hmm. championship. Um, and I think it was the first time like a sibling duo. Oh, her brother sister um, won. Won um, like kind of parallel events. Yeah, yeah. Oh, very interesting. So yeah, we have some more moves in this game. I see so Queen white B6. So white played E3. Oh, E3, Queen B6. Queen B6, Knight A3. Okay, so this is the first kind of interesting moment to discuss because uh, this is probably one of the most challenging ways black can play against a London where uh, the idea is to just target white's weak point, mm -hmm. the undefended pawn on B2. And normally white does not want to concede something like B3 or Queen C1. Um, so in this position, White played the move that I like to play, and it's not the most well-known move, but um, it's very tricky, pawn, or knight to a3, um, where you leave the pawn undefended, but if black takes it, then um, it, it can get very, very complicated. Mm -hmm. um, now, black did not take the pawn, as I see. Yeah, black played d6. d6. But I'm guessing queen takes b2, there would be like... Knight B5. So I actually have a funny story about uh, this position happened to me about a month, 
about a month ago, I was playing online on chess.com against Takaru Nakamura. And it was part of like this uh, streamers tournament. It was mm -hmm. Arena Kings event. And uh, it was a, like towards the end of the tournament, it was clear Nakamura was going to win. And um, I was lucky to get a game with him. Um, and we went into this line. I played knight a3. And he went ahead and took the pawn. Wow. And I went back and watched his stream after the game. And he, he was clearly not like fully informed about this variation. Um, because after knight b5, if white wants to, white has a forced draw. Mm -hmm. um, he played knight d5. And what I did was I played rook b1, queen takes a2, rook a1. And essentially offered him a draw um, where, I mean, black really has nothing better than to go for repetition. Right. And then what happened was, it was like a three minute game. And he really didn't want to draw, and he took maybe a minute, wow. let a minute burn off his clock, and then played queen takes b1. And then I went on to beat him uh, <laughs> from this position, like I'm of off a queen. He but he, he fought valiantly, like he, he <laughs> fought to a point where like at the end of the game I flagged him with two seconds left. Wow. Um, so he, he almost came back and like embarrassed me terribly. But uh, That's a... it's a nice approach against like a super strong grandmaster in blitz. To just go for like a repetition line and hope they go insane. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because as white, you could still uh, play on if you choose. You don't. So there, there is a different do. approach here. Mm -hmm. um, I believe the move, and it, it's a type of variation you should really prepare with the engine. Um, it's a move to play a three, where it's hard to explain this without really like digging deep with the engine. But uh, you prevent the queen from coming back to b4. Mm -hmm. And there's some long-term ideas of playing bishop c4 and rook a2 to trap the queen. Wow. Um, and it still gets very complicated. I think there's some lines where black ends up sacrificing the queen, but gets a couple, uh, couple pieces for it. Um, like there's a main line a6, rook b1, queen a2, um, and then queen c1, so giving up the knight. And then rook a1, trapping the queen. Queen takes a1, queen takes a1. And it's a very complex position where it's hard to trust a computer because it's a strange material imbalance. Um, but it's a type of variation you, you should probably play if you're if you're looking to try and win as white. Yeah. Um, but it seemed like black did not want to uh, to go for that. Yeah. I think rightly so because black is a higher rated player. Right. White has a chance to force a draw out of the opening. Probably um, not what Black wants to allow. And d6 is a, the main alternative, uh, keeping the game a bit uh, bit quieter. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have knight c4. Knight c4 played. Queen c6. A4. Queen c6. Mm -hmm. Seems like a strange square where it's just aligned with the the king, and like someday there could be tactics, and you're also taking away the c6 square from your knight. Yeah. I'm usually kind of more weird. inclined to play queen c7. Ah, uh, so we're preventing d5. Yeah, maybe some prophylaxis. Um, yeah, that's still And sometimes black wants to play like just b5 and bishop b7, uh, gain some time. Um, any more moves after queen c6? Yeah, a few moves. White played a4. Mm -hmm. So restricting b5. Knight bd7. Mm -hmm. C3. G6. H3. Bishop g7. Okay, so it looks like we're kind of entering some more standard London setup. Like both sides now beginning to follow opening principles. It's interesting at the beginning of the game, like we see knight a3 and queen b6 very, very early, um, where, it, where they were kind of justified because of the tactical nature, but uh, eventually you do have to follow some principles. I would imagine white is very soon going for knight f3 bishop e2 go for castling yeah. and um, it's a dynamic middle game i played these structures as white um usually what black wants to do someday is is get in this e5 break mm -hmm. um, usually white wants to go for some sort of squeeze where you're um you're you're playing restrictively you usually put the bishop back on h2 um sometimes play a5 and uh and, and just maintain like a solid position. 
Um, but I can imagine a very long fight in, in this game where yeah, where Black will be probably sharp. be the one trying to to grind things down for a win. Yeah, I mean it's like two two junior players playing. Um, uh, Bryce Tiglon, I believe he was also one of the the Dinker winners, so mm -hmm. he's another big winner from from the past weekend. That's true. Um, yeah, these games just tend to even if they start off kind of um, tepid. Okay, we're gonna have some slow development from here. For sure, it's gonna open up at some point, and uh, things are gonna get pretty messy. I feel like this is like the calm before the storm. Like all these games are developing quietly, but then. Right. In a moment, we're going to have like five kings getting made in at once, <laughs> things hanging all over the place. Um, I, I believe, by the way, the game on board one has, has finished already, according Whoa. to the uh, US Chess Live. I think this is something I had mentioned earlier that could be a, a quick draw or a long grind. No, no, we totally call this one. But, yeah, 100%. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you can replay the tape. At no point were we really expecting this game to last super long but yeah i have the uh, i mean we were having so much fun like analyzing these lines with knight takes d5 queen takes b2 and um, we, we got a lot of it on the board actually uh -huh. so we can so I can what, update you. yeah yeah what exactly happened after queen takes f6 uh so white did take on d5 okay. queen takes b2 was played and uh, white played rook b1 Oh, I see what. Okay, so I just clicked the connect button because when we lost connection, it stopped updating. We weren't. And this will be now will be updated. So now it's it's actually fully updated. That's great. Um, yeah, this is nice. Rook B one. Um, okay, so this is one of the variations we were looking at, I believe. Yeah. King H one. Queen E five was played, and then White went ahead and played F four. F four double edge move. It's, I think we got to this position earlier, and we're. Was looking at looking rookie at rookie one. one, yeah, exactly. Um, F four is not a move that comes to mind initially. Um, Actually, I thought about this move. Tapped. I just didn't want to calculate it. Yeah, it's the type <laughs> of move like sometimes if you're if you're lazy, you, you consider, but you don't dig deeper. But with professional players, if if it's playable and it leads to like forcing variations, you have to calculate it. Mm -hmm. um, so both queens currently hanging. Um, looks like players trade it off. Takes on d one. Takes on e five. Bishop retreats to g4. Um, so black maintains the bishop pair. White played h3. I have a question. Can white just take a pawn? Knight takes c7. Free pawn. Maybe black gets some counterplay. Rook c8. And this pawn is also weak. Yeah, the, I would guess that white's extra pawn here is just very hard to, to utilize. It is yeah. kind of curious as to why. Specifically, the pawn I mean, was probably taken. rook c8. I mean, white has three isolated pawns. Black has initiative. The knight uh, it could retreat to d5. It seems like black's going to get a ton of initiative either by attacking the knight or the pawn. Yeah, actually, even bishop b6 right away seems uh, yeah. annoying. And, yeah, we so, don't want to play knight c3. So yeah, I'm guessing with the two bishops, black just has full compensation there. So h3 played bishop d7, and then okay, then white takes the pawn. And white took. Knight goes back to d5, rook f8, rook f e1, current position, they... And the game is drawn, so it seems like draw, a draw was probably offered at this point, and... Um, well, okay, it's understandable in an uh, open tournament, these guys are currently tied for first. Mm -hmm. uh, so if the game on board 2 also finishes in a draw, which more likely to, to do that than not, then they'll still be uh, tied for first going into the next rounds, and they can take more risks in uh, round eight and round nine. Yeah, It's interesting after, potentially after seven rounds, there could, I mean, the top score could be six out of seven, mm -hmm. which um, should invite a lot of players. This big. Yeah. I mean, that gives a lot of players a chance to, to, to climb up in the last few rounds. Um, let's see if there's any updates with Gareev and Swirts. Uh, hey, they, they developed their pieces and they castled and now we're in a middle game. Wow, a lot of moves. Um, looks like a somewhat symmetrical position. Um, so we, we last saw the position. I was drawing so many arrows. We're daydreaming so much about the Pillsbury attack. Um, let's see how the players developed. Bishop b7. Um, looks all pretty natural. Seems like both sides have very similar ideas. Yeah. Like black also has a potential to go for the the Pillsbury attack. Absolutely. Um, knight c3, uh, which has some some interesting ideas to it. Maybe knight b5 ideas, potential maneuvers to the king side. Yeah, probably knight e2 mm -hmm. is usually the, the point. But yeah, a6. I mean, yeah. you you don't want to allow knight b5 here and allow white to get the bishop yeah. pair so easily. 
Um, now a4. What is a4? Wants to a4 is wants to play usually queen c1, queen c1 bishop, a3. bishop a3. Yeah, mm -hmm. to trade off the the bishops. And... Yeah, allowing the rook to control a3. Yeah, because it. I mean, it feels like a very solid position for black, and it is. But there is some strategic danger, especially if this dark square bishop gets traded off. Then the c7 pawn is going to be weak or potentially backwards. Black's bishop on b7 is a bad bishop, but okay, sometimes it can be good for black because mm -hmm. it's supporting the knight on e4. Um, yeah, strategically, it's. Uh, it's a pretty complicated position. I think it's a great choice for, for Gareev because he gets to just play this uh, fighting middle game. Um, I'm sure he, he's trying to play for the win here. So he needs mm -hmm. something that's not going to simplify into an end game, can drag the game out, uh, and yeah, eventually try to go for it. in uh, Not mutual time trouble, but when the, the game is more complicated. And a few more moves have been played. Uh, castling uh, pawn a5. Interesting, going for some sort of uh, like pawn thrust to potentially weaken Black's position. Uh, b5 looks very natural, and now knight e2. So we're not seeing this queen c1 idea, um, but white has kind of fixed Black's queenside pawns, and now going for this maneuver, um, I'd imagine white is is dreaming of knight g3 and knight f5, or knife yeah. f5, knife f5. <laughs> um, which could pose Black some problems. Um, so it looks like, yeah, it looks like a very strategic game with uh, a lot of play to come. Yeah, and I noticed uh, someone in the chat looks like Knight B3 was trying to to cheer. I was just going to mention that. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, we should say so. the The US Chess Twitch account is not Twitch affiliate, so there's so you can't cheer, the... you can't sub, unfortunately. But you can donate. So if you would like to support the show, uh, and you want to let US Chess know that this was a good idea to do the stream. Please use the the donate link. Um, I think there's a couple ways to donate. It looks like Mubot just posted a link there. And so um, if you donate through the, the link way. that Mubot posted, um, it's through Streamlabs. So there should be a, a nice pop up when someone donates. Um, we have yet to see any donations so far, but someday. Nice. But happen. yeah, you guys can yeah. continue to at least cheer in the chat. Nothing will actually happen, but <laughs> at least we'll see it and we'll know that we're doing a good job. <laughs> yeah, we'll get some uh, some motivation, <laughs> some energy. Yeah, exactly. So, which uh, which see, game to look at? Any cycle developments? through the games here. Ooh, let's look at the Mikalevsky game. I think this one's going to be really interesting. Ooh. Yeah, we were kind of falling asleep earlier to all these like Catalans, <laughs> and now we we have a Catalan which is seemingly having some more fire. Uh, sets of double pawns for each side. Um, if we go back, so this was a one without d4. Black took on on c4. Uh, White castled knight d7. Now knight a3, a very typical idea to uh, try and regain the pawn with the knight. This also prevents pawn b5, um, but does allow bishop takes a3, which was played, mm -hmm. um, doubling white's pawns. And this is a very um, kind of imbalancing move where yeah. black gives white the bishop pair, but um, also damages white's pawn structure, and in some cases does try to hold on to the, the pawn on c4. Yeah, because white is losing a lot here. I mean, yeah. not only doubling the pawns, but doubling b takes a3 so now getting two a pawns which are much weaker than than two b pawns because they only control two squares yeah i i only like made this realization recently <laughs> that rook pawns only control one square yeah. and, and any pawn closer to the center controls two squares yeah i mean who came up which... with that that's <laughs> totally unfair yeah hey yeah. it's Looks a donation like a donation esoteric pa donating 15 dollars. i think that worked Hey, shout out yeah. to Esoteric. Thank you appreciate so much. That. Stream is appreciated. Whoever you are, appreciate that. Um, yeah, this is historic <laughs> for US chess. And we got 2,700 cheers from Doge and Pika for life. <laughs> nice. Very nice. So, so yeah. if we go forward a few moves, mm -hmm. let's just see what's happening. Rook b8 is very, uh, very typical. Get off the diagonal of the bishop, prepare pawn b5. Um, I should note, you don't want to play pawn b5 right away, which could walk into a move like uh, like knight d4. Yeah. And then if you play rook b8, this is not only a fork, but it's just trapping the queen. 
So that's huge danger. Yeah, rook b8, safety first. Rook b1. And now c5. What's the idea of c5? c5 is ambitious. I mean, it seems to be fighting for some space, fighting for the dark squares. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe restricting, uh, also stopping this knight e4 idea, which could be. Yeah, to imagine that uh, maybe black was still pondering b5, but still annoyed that this. This move comes with a double threat. Yeah. So c5 is nice. It's this restrictive. Is, uh, this is painful. And um, yeah, it seems like b5 could be the, the next move if, uh, if possible. Yeah, I mean, I think this, this game is going to be very exciting because we, we're going to see what Mikulevsky can do with this dark square bishop. Right. It's going to be uh, very, very annoying for black to deal with this one. So we're actually going to take a quick break, but we'll be back with more action. Uh, reminder again, I'm going to share the link in the chat. You can watch the games on leechess.org. You can click the links that Mubat is sharing to find out more information about the tournament. And we will be back momentarily. Stay with us.
bring our audio back and go here and now we're back um hopefully you guys can see and hear us we are joined by a special guest which you cannot see but with the magic of uh oh wait a minute <laughs> have to uh not mess this up too much um there we go wow magic the magic of art. now we're joined by uh pete Karagiannis. Hope I didn't butcher the last name too Very much. Good. Very close. Yes. Um, assistant director of events at U.S. Chess. Um, you have a lot of insight into what you, the U.S. Chess Federation is up to these days, um, and I know you're you're playing a crucial role at this event. Um, so, if you want, want to first talk about uh, like the initiatives that U.S. Chess is up to, it'd be great to hear. Yeah, thanks, Eric, and thanks, Kostya, both of you guys, for being mm -hmm. here and, and putting on this great show. Um, it's wonderful to have you both. You know, as a, as a federation, we're, we're really interested in, in outreach, and I think the Twitch stream is a way to reach some of those communities and people who would never have that interaction otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this is really important work. Um, you know, we have actually a lot of initiatives that we're working on at the moment. Um, we view ourselves mainly as an educational nonprofit. And so a lot of the communities that we're working with, we're trying to grow chess in these underrepresented communities, um, such as, you know, for example, at-risk youth, mm -hmm. um, working with the schools, uh, providing chess as an educational tool, not only in the classroom, but even in more informal settings too, like streaming, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think you guys, I, I, I learned so much just sitting out in the audience, so uh, wonderful to listen to you. And we enjoy it too. I mean, it's great uh, to have this sort of aspect of a tournament where in, in the past it's just been players focused in their games and there's no there's no sort of like exposure for the whole world to watch. And right. It's definitely the right direction to go in. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. You know, I, I hope that our audience would agree. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, one of the things that, that uh, makes this possible is our members, our membership, our viewers. But we are a nonprofit. You know, we are a 501c3. Mm -hmm. um, all donations made to us. Thank you to our very first donation ever, by the way. I, I wish I could give you a million rounds of applause, mm -hmm. um, but those are all tax deductible. Um, so we hope if you enjoy the show, if you enjoy this sort of thing, if you appreciate or approve of what US Chess is doing, um, we'd love to have your support. You can do that either via the donation link on our Twitch page, um, which gets you a cool, is it GIF or GIF? Did we have? Did we ever have that debate settled? Like, I, I usually say GIF, but... I know there's some hardcore people. Most serious out there people who, say GIF. I'm yeah. just gonna say it. I say GIF, but you know there are some GIF, right? Like there's, there's a segment, like a small. There is some GIF, but there's some GIF. Our live That's audience butter, though, is so. saying GIF, and yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, um, if you if you like the stream, if you if you like what these gentlemen are doing, which I'm I'm a huge fan. I'm sitting out there listening to them live and watching on my phone, mm -hmm. so I'm like double dipping or double trouble, what have you. Um, if you like that, please support us. Uh, you know, we're, we're working uh, every day very hard to um, complete our mission, to reach to those communities that, uh, that are underrepresented in the chess realm, and to, uh, and to spread the game. Um, not only through things like the stream, but uh, through some of our initiatives as well. The Women's Committee has done a great job working with seniors as well. Uh, you know, we had the second ever National Tournament of Senior Champions this year. Mm -hmm. and, um, I believe we had a few more states represented. I'm hoping in the future we'll get to all 50. That'd be great. Awesome. Was that the, the tournament? Who won that tournament? The senior one? Is that uh, that that's Getz? a good question. It was yes, it was Fide Master. Uh, I forgot his first Shelby? Shelby. Shelby Getz. Getz. That's right. Yeah. I wasn't sure, but yeah, that was, that was so cool to see because there's yeah there's a lot of GMs playing in that section, but it was like a Fide Master who ended up winning. That's yeah, cool. he had some exciting games, and uh, I, I saw one of the coolest parts to me was watching after the rounds out in the hotel foyer, the seniors analyzing their games right next to the juniors, you know, going, uh, going through each other's games. That's really games cool, like different generations. Yeah, you could, yeah. I mean, you could literally see it, you know, it was one table and you could just see the generations kind of <laughs> in a line, so. Um, that's great. Yeah. But, yeah, it'd be a cool stat. I wonder how many, like, uh, either former U.S. champion winners like we have in the event. So I feel like there's at least a few playing. But Definitely. I mean, Shabalov has won quite a few, I think, right? Um, oh, also yeah. Events in the past, so. But anyway, thank you guys for, for letting me come in and, and sit down with you. Appreciate um, it. Absolutely. Can you tell us, like, what's next? Like, over the next few months, what can people in the U.S. look forward to 
like from US chess? That's a good question. We actually, we have a lot of exciting stuff um, coming up. So as you know, uh, our next national event is the K through 12 back here in Orlando. Mm. So I get to take uh, another flight right back to Orlando. This building, Rosen Center. Um, it is not Rosen no. Center. It is at um, a Disney property, oh, okay. uh, Coronado Springs. Sounds so exciting. So that's our next national event. Um, but in between now and then, we're sending some teams. We have a team headed to the Olympiad, which we're sporting. We have a team headed to the World Youth mm -hmm. Championship in India. Um, so it's very exciting. Um, and we have some under the radar things too, which I can't say too much about, but I think our membership will be very happy to see once they're fully underway. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for, for stopping in and hope you continue to enjoy the stream. I will. Yeah. I will. And thank you guys for being here. And let's get back to those really exciting games. All right. Sounds <laughs> good. Yeah, yeah, we have a ton of developments yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, in the games. Let me go ahead and enlarge us back to normal size. And the game I have up currently is an end game. Last wow. time we looked at this game, it was very early in the opening. Um, we last saw the position when bishop d3 was played. And I was saying that uh, black was going to go for the minority attack. And actually, there's a result in this game. Andrew Tang has already won. He's already won the game. Wow. Uh, we that should see how this happened. Um, I mean, it seemed like pretty solid position for both sides. Yeah. And at some point, Tang does go for rook b8, um, anticipating yeah, b5, the so-called minority attack. When I was a younger chess player, I was under the like false impression that minority attack is simply when you attack with your minor pieces and didn't realize it's when you attack with your pawn minority. In this case, uh, simply one pawn is attacking um, a, a larger group of pawns. And the idea for black is to simply create some weakness in white structure and open up more lines. Yeah, it's counterintuitive, but this attack is basically effective because since black doesn't have a C pawn, black has an extra semi-open file that they can use on the, the queen side to put pressure. And so if you get an extra rook or rook and queen there, then you can really add a lot of um, pressure to the C3 pawn. Exactly. And when B4 comes, white has to make some sort of concession. Like either you take on B4 and isolate your D pawn, or you allow black to take, and then you're wound up with either a backwards pawn on C3, or if you take with queen, you're wound up with isolated D pawn. So white uh, did take in this, or white played C4 in this position. Um, but then after it takes and takes, this pawn is isolated and now on the half-open file. And sometimes these very small positional advantages can make a big difference in high-level play. And a player like Andrew Tang will be very, very happy to, uh, to have an advantage like this as black. Mm -hmm. And I like this move, bishop e7, unleashing the queen and preparing the simple maneuver bishop f6 to further target the pawn. Rook d1. Queen d5 blockading the pawn. Um, and so far, it just seems like a very smooth positional game from Black. He neutralized the opening very easily, putting his pieces now um, very nice harmony. Four attackers against the pawn on d4. And looks like he just won the pawn. Wow, Knight three. takes e5. Wow, yeah. rook takes. So, okay, a lot of trades. White temporarily sacked the exchange to win it back with knight c6. Um, but black is up a pawn, and oh, rook takes c4. Um, so it seems to be giving back yeah. the exchange in the most effective way. Yeah, I like this move, rook takes c4, where, yeah. okay, you know you're going to lose the rook for knights. Why not damage white's pawn structure further? And do it with tempo, so now you get like rook c8 as well. And keep the initiative. Another tempo, exactly. And you're still up uh, material, and uh, yeah, it worked out very nicely. Now hitting the... The knight and the pawn on g4. Yeah. Oh, I love this move. The, the trick of the season, knight d5. Ooh. Okay, this pawn is pinned to a square. That's right. So should not take the knight. Should not even touch the knight. It would be tragic for black. The bishop d4, nice response. Just leave the knight. Awkward on d5. Uh, rook b1. White's still dreaming of back rank mates. g5, making luft for the king. Uh, fixing white's pawn on g4, knight b4, and now bishop b6, knight d3, rook takes g4, white resigned, just down two pawns, no compensation to show, four on 
two majorities should be more than enough to uh, to win the game. Yeah, I mean, in my opinion, I think this is a little bit early to resign just because there are always ways for one side to go wrong, mm -hmm. especially fighting against the Knight. Now, granted, against a super strong GM, uh, I mean, I, White's chances here are very close to, to zero. Very slim. Um, so I, I definitely don't blame him for, for resigning. But for those of you out there, you know, if you're if you're not playing against the Grandmaster, I would say by all means keep keep fighting because the sure. you know people do very strange things even in completely winning positions. But yeah, it's a very dire situation. Well, I do have a rule. Usually, I, I enforce this rule for my younger students: mm -hmm. never resign when you have a knight. Because knights are tricky, like one missed fork, it could be uh, could change things around. And there's another rule, never resign when you have a rook. Because <laughs> there's cases where your rook is your last piece, and then you can force, sacrifice it, and then wind up in stalemate. Mm -hmm. So between those like two rules, you can sometimes save a lot of uh, hopeless positions. That's a good one. But, um, okay, Andrew will, will convert this. Um, probably just 100% of the time. So, Yeah, there was a question a little while ago in the chat from Amazing1983. What's the best way for an improving player to learn from us reviewing these games? Mm -hmm. So my honest answer would be to hit the video full screen button and not chat and <laughs> just focus on the chess the whole time. Like if you truly wanted to treat this as like a chess lesson, then that would be um, my advice. And actually, I mean, I used to do that, and I still do when I'm trying to work on my own chess. I'll I'll watch Peter Svidler doing commentary sure. or Peter Leiko and just try to follow what they're saying. Uh, try to analyze the position with, with my own eyes without looking at the uh, the engine evaluation, and um, especially paying attention to moments where the evaluation given from the commentators is completely different to what you intuitively think about the position. Uh, I definitely had that many times where I'm looking at a position and Spiller says something like, yeah, it looks like a crushing attack for White. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at it like, what? Where is the attack? And I think these are the moments where you can uh, really like expand your, your knowledge about the game. When a stronger player gives some opinion, you don't quite understand it, you can try to break it down and, and gain, gain more insight into the game. Oh, for sure. I have to agree with all of what you, you just said. Um, I'll also say that, uh, especially tournament commentary, it's a great way to prepare for your own tournament games because you're really you're um, kind of internalizing all aspects of chess. Like we're covering openings, middle games, kind of thought process, tactical situations, positional situations, end games. Um, so you get like this nice balance yeah. of uh, of elements that will affect your own games. Um, one thing maybe I, I do have to disagree with is that you're still more than welcome to like voice your, your opinion in the chat. <laughs> and if you have like interesting questions, I think um, especially part of being a good learner is, is finding um, like interesting questions to ask and questions that will, will cause us to like share even more knowledge, even share our secrets That's with true. audience. That's a good point. Um, yeah, we should, yeah, I should amend my statement to say, if you can ask insightful questions, then you will actually get of course. a lot more, a lot more out of it. Of course, some people are just in the chat, just stopping by, saying hi. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, it's good to see, good to see a, a diverse community, especially online right now. Uh, someone bringing up the Rosen trap, which I don't think I want to go down this this wormhole. But uh, it's another reason not to resign, where uh, uh, you you try and hope your opponent pre moves and. Uh, and stalemates you, which I've had a few times um, in some some quicker time control games. Yeah, I mean that has become like your signature trick. You should a bit, yeah. Get that <laughs> named after you. <laughs> anyway, let's get back to the games. There's a lot of developments, and yeah, I think there's to a check game. Check out the mid cop game. Yeah, it was crazy opening turning into a crazy middle game. Um, and now we were asking everyone earlier what they would do after pawn b4. Would they rather put their knight on the rim or put their knight back on the starting square? Mm -hmm. And it was almost unanimous for yeah, knight Yeah, everyone said knight b1, including myself. I thought this was the more likely move. And I agreed with it too. Just reroute the knight towards the king side. Uh, Grandmaster Mitkoff chose knight a4, which does have some logic. I mean, you, you do control more squares uh, directly. Um, discouraging bishop c5 or queen b6. Um, and now black struck in the center with pawn d5. 
which is interesting because usually if you're underdeveloped, you should avoid opening the center. Um, black here, the king's still in the center, a lot of pieces still not developed. Really only the knights are developed. And now f4, yeah, which I really nice like move. this move mm -hmm. from, uh, from Mikhoff. Um, essentially saying that, okay, if the center opens up, it, it should favor white. Um, white just has a safer king um, and now dreaming of, of opening the f-file, also um, opening the diagonal so the, the bishop and rook can target f7. Yeah, rook and bishop often make a date on the f7 square using this f4 push. and basically forces black to take on b3 because now it's just too dangerous to let white keep this bishop on the board. That's true, and that's exactly what happened. Takes, takes. And now bishop d6, so black uh, trying to reinforce the center while developing. Of course, wants to castle very soon. Mm -hmm. uh, takes on e5, takes on e5, and now queen e1. This is an interesting move, hitting the b-pawn, but also planning to maneuver the queen to the king's side. Uh, potentially organizing some attack. Like if you can get a queen to h4 or a bishop to g5, um, there can be a lot of pressure against this knight on f6. Not to mention ideas of d4 combined with, with pawn e5. Um, so black took bishop f4. Bishop f4, yeah, very mm. interesting, very enterprising. Just, oh, did you take a pawn? <laughs> like, oh, I just wanted to develop my pieces. So yeah, not regaining the pawn, but just, just completing development, essentially. Bishop takes f4. Um, now it's white to move. White has a couple options. I would imagine white will take back on f4 with the knight, just unleashing the queen along the e-file. Mm -hmm. um, now black does have a chance to castle. You could imagine some line like this where black castles, white regains a pawn, and then there's some strategic imbalances. Like it was very sharp for, for many moves there, but now it starting to look a bit more positional, where I mean, both sides have some deficiencies with their structure. Uh, white has two knights against black's bishop and knights. Yeah. Any side that you would prefer here? I mean, I feel like, is this uh, the live position on the board? Or... Oh, actually, there's a few more moves updated. My takes f4 was played. Mm -hmm. Or no, sorry. Those were the moves that I made. Um, this is still the, the position that we have after bishop takes f4. I see. Okay, so now... Presumably the game is ahead by a couple moves. Yeah. So white has already decided whether knight of four, probably knight of four would be played. Looks a lot more natural. Guess black would castle. Yeah, I feel like after d4, I mean, with the position opening up, it just seems like black's bishop is the one that's just going to be very, very happy here. Um, so I feel like this is actually a very risky position for white to go into. Maybe he mm -hmm. can also um, take on b4 with the queen instead of taking on e4. Oh, Just with the idea B4. of taking on d3 with the knight. Mm -hmm. And maybe trying to keep more of a structural advantage. That's interesting, yeah. This, I mean, black is left with these seemingly very weak pawns, especially the A pawn on the half-open file. Yeah. White has very good control over C5, which is a, just a beautiful square for the knight. Imagining the queen moves somewhere and then pawn D4 later. So, so some, some nice positional here for potential. Black. Yeah, this queen leaves D8, and white will just immediately sack on F6 and just open up the king. Um, I would imagine black should be okay somehow, but, uh, well, uh, definitely a lot of room to go wrong here, probably for both sides. So let's see, let me check the, the multi-board view. So yeah, let's just for, for anyone who's watching on leechess.org, um, we do have the, the multi-board view. I'll switch to full window here. And uh, this is the best place to really watch all the games uh, we have 12 games going simultaneously, two of which are, are finished. Um, we Maybe. also have the live stream below. We can get um, back to the... Along um, with the multi-board view if you click this this icon right here. Yeah, so. very nice to see all the games. I think we should get to the uh, Moradi Abadi game against Julian Perleko. Uh-huh. Because they've, they've had a lot of simplifications. Wow, another end game. Okay, to, to be fair, it is like two and a half hours into the round, but this is still pretty soon to see an endgame, just so many pieces off the board. And it is over. Wow, I've, like, I, I just began counting material and now realize white has just this monster battery. Um, yeah, it looks, wow. it looks like black is about to resign or something. Black it's did already... resign. It's already... Oh, the game's over. Right? Oh, yeah. excuse me. Yeah, nice. 
So this is our second decisive game. So should we go game. back a little bit just to see what happened? Maybe yeah, 10 moves or so? We, um, let's see what the structure was. Yeah, it was one of these like slow kind of Catalan ready type positions. Um, seemed quiet, even early middle game. Um, Queens got traded. Yeah, seems like a pretty dry position. Um, surprise the game ends ended so quickly uh, from a position like this. Yeah, clearly something something happened. <laughs> there were some developments. Yes, yeah, still so far, I mean, both sides look very solid. Uh, I like King d8 going for King c7. e4. Okay, e4 is probably a critical uh, kind of transition where white uh, clearly wants to um, change the structure, mm -hmm. ideas of e5. And also to just try and open the center, like black's king is, uh, is aligned with the rook. And even though the file is very closed, there's still some aspects of, of x-ray vision. Um, and yeah. I mean, this is it. We, we did see the final position and we saw this battery along the default. <laughs> we know how that's going to work out. So. But yeah, it's very logical. I mean, chess is a game of, of imbalances. White has the two bishops here, and this bishop on g2 is just not doing a whole lot against this b7, c6, d5 pawn chain. So yeah. White's move e4, I think, is absolutely principled. Just trying to maximize the power of the bishop, trying to open up lines. Um, we should also point out that Black's rooks here are, are disconnected. It is an endgame, but that's still important. And so if you open up the position and your rooks are coordinated, your opponent's rooks are not, usually it's just going to work out better for you uh, in most cases. So, yeah, I think there's there's multiple reasons why e4 should be played. Like Black's just Black's king, Black's rooks, yeah. White has a bishop pair. Um, and yeah, you, you aim arrows, to make this, amazing. <laughs> this bishop and rook happy. Yeah, yeah it's, yeah, it's, it's so. a very thumbnail-worthy position. <laughs> If, if this does go on YouTube, this, this has great thumbnail potential. Mm -hmm. um, so going forward here, uh, trade happened, position opened up. Knight went back to c3 to uh, presumably prepare this d5 break to make the, the bishop and rook even happier. Mm -hmm. and also just avoiding trades after bishop b7, black wanted to maybe take on e4. And now with this move, white just, uh, just avoids the trade and keeps more pressure. So knight e8. Now trade the bishops, and now white strikes with d5. Yeah. It's actually a, a beautiful kind of positional game. Um, I know like a lot of a lot of chess games where queens are traded off early have the tendency to kind of be dry and boring. Sure. But this is a great example of how to really um, outplay your opponent quickly in the middle game. Um, I feel like this is this is a position I'll show students where where give them the position right before e4 mm -hmm. and say white to move. And uh, and find the best move. Yeah, nice concept. Early Canada for my U.S. chess game of the day. Sure. <laughs> that I'll be doing for for tomorrow. Because uh, just yeah, very nice. Concept so going forward here, I mean, White already has a lot of a uh, lot of strong initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, one upon on c6. Okay, traded pawn on c6 for h3. Um, but keeps initiative. Yeah, now the position is opened up, and Black's king is caught in the center, and, and the king is tied down to defending the knight. Has to walk into the pin and then very simple conversion and the knight on, on b5 plays a, a nice role preventing rook a7. It looks like black and resign here. The rooks are still like very discoordinated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful game from, from Elshan. And I saw him yesterday and he was, um, I don't know if he was complaining, but he was agonizing over the fact that he had so many long games at the beginning of the tournament, mm -hmm. like a few five hour games. Mm -hmm. And in a tournament like this, you want to conserve energy. And if you have a few long ones at the start, it can um, it can have a, its effects later on in the tournament. Right, and because it's a huge section, all the top players are, are playing down for the first four or five rounds. In mm -hmm. the first rounds especially, they're playing players that are 800, 900 points below them. So yeah, having a five hour game with someone that far down it can be a little, a little frustrating. But now he moves up to uh, six points out of seven, so he'll be doing. So great. he could be tied for first. Potentially if, uh, tied for two the is a draw. Yeah, maybe we should get back to that game and see if um, we've had some developments. Uh, and, um, oh wow! Mm -hmm. So we could, uh, yeah, we could switch to another. Uh, yeah, we can take a look here. Um, 
Now we don't know if how like how accurate the times are. Mm-hmm. It'd be nice to have someone like check in the tournament hall if they're on if they're the, actually corresponding the to the yeah. clocks. We need a U.S. chess correspondent, <laughs> right? Um, and earpieces and and the drone would be nice, but um, yeah, yeah it seems like could a pretty, take care of that function, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, it seems very positional. Uh, if we go back just a few moves, looks like both. Both sides just playing very solidly. At some point, the structure on the queen side closed down after a5. No, uh, no more pawn breaks on the queen side. Um, and this is the type of position, like even if you're down a ton of time, mm-hmm. it's still pretty simple to play, and it can be a long grind. Um, and like on move 40, players get additional time, so. I would imagine there's not going to be too many like hugely difficult decisions to make for the next several moves. Yeah, we'll see. It's just so closed. I mean, this is an example of a position that's kind of good for the knights. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily like white is much better, but this is kind of what you want when you're fighting against the two bishops. This position where it's still pretty closed. Locked bishop on b7 is obviously passive, but the bishop on d6, I would say, is not that great of a PC there because just very restricted, doesn't have any and white's pawns, clear right? targets. Whereas both of White's knights here have their own good squares, they're not fighting over the, the same squares. Um, and uh, I mean, yeah, strategically, this could one day go go very wrong for Black if he's not careful. Though I think for the moment, Black is probably still very solid and doing just fine. Yeah, there's some idea here, like bishop a6, and if you really want to get rid of this bishop, it's pretty easy to trade it off for a knight. That's true. There's another idea to fight for the c file. I mean, this is the only open file, and. It, it could be a, a pathway for a lot of trades. If flat goes for queen d7, rook c8, major pieces can come off very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd imagine if anyone's playing for a win, it would be black. Um, with the idea of bishop a6, but also with some idea of, of maybe expanding on the king side. Um, so I'm not sure. Like, yeah, and then Black has the time advantage. Time advantage, higher, higher rated rating, player. Yeah, so he has the psychological, like, I'm supposed to be better here. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that, I feel like that always that always, yeah, comes into play. Yeah, I can't, um, can't count how many games I have where during the game I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm better here, I'm pressing. And then you check the game with the engine, it's like, no, it was equal, you were slightly mm-hmm. worse. <laughs> it's like, okay, I played the game, I know what happened. Like, <laughs> But sometimes the engine doesn't understand, like, kind of the long-term nature in these positions where you can just really grind for so many moves and, and try yeah. and force your opponent to make decisions along the way. This is almost intangible, yeah, yeah. for the engine. Okay. And we should also note mm-hmm. that like this round is a merge round, so all the schedules are now on the same schedule, and there's just one game a day um, until the end of the tournament. Right. One game tomorrow evening and then the following day. Um, so especially in this round, players can basically grind all night and then sleep in tomorrow because tomorrow's round is also 7 p.m. Yeah, we'll have time so, to, to recover. And we'll be back with uh, the final coverage for rounds 8 and 9, which mm-hmm. is awesome. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be following this turn until the end, to, until we decide, uh, or not we decide, but until winner is, uh, is decided. Yeah, we'll, we'll stay, especially for the, the critical games on the top boards, we'll, mm-hmm. we'll be with it. Uh, so, yeah, that's a great question, if there is a tie-break. Um, I would imagine there there would be an Armageddon, and yeah, they should they play would. it on a DGT board, and we should be doing commentary. Yeah, I remember at the World Open yeah. recently, they had a... They had a tiebreak game, so I think it was it was Jeffrey Zhang and Lequang Liam who, mm-hmm. who tied for first, and they both won something like ten thousand dollars each, or like eight thousand dollars for first place. And then they had him play a tiebreak Armageddon game for the official winner, and That's of course that two hundred dollar uh, bonus prize that everyone is always <laughs> so interested in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the Armageddon so game could that potentially is important. Yeah. determine. The spot at U.S. Championship. No, that that has happened before when two U.S. players uh, tie for first, and then I think it was Mac Molnar and Josh Friedel a couple mm-hmm. years ago played a tie break, and uh, Josh Friedel ended up winning that one and, and qualifying for the U.S. Championship. Mm-hmm. That must be crazy. Yeah, blitz game that determines yeah. like your next two years of chess, basically. Well, this actually <laughs> happened to me. Yeah, no, it so, is. Last place prize the US yeah, yeah. At least that. <laughs> in 2009, I played in the U.S. Open 
and tied for first. And the winner of U.S. Open qualifies for U.S. Junior Closed. So I played in the Armageddon game. Oh, U.S. Junior Open. U.S. Junior Open, yeah. Oh, did I say U.S. Open? U.S. <laughs> Junior Open. Yeah, so it, um, it came down to an Armageddon game, which I ended up winning. Qualified for U.S. Junior Closed. The following year, U.S. Junior Close was held in St. Louis. Last place was like five hundred dollars, so I was guaranteed that. Okay. Um, and it was a tournament where they gave all the juniors like new laptops because they they had some partnership with HP. So that one Armageddon game just got me so much, yeah. and I got to play in a field of like Ray Robson, Sam Shankland. So it was an amazing experience. Yeah, it's funny how chess is like that. You have this like super long nine round tournament and this high stakes blitz game right. for like. <laughs> Incredible amount of money. Now, we do have confirmation from Pete in the chat that if there is an Armageddon, uh, there will absolutely be a DGT board. And um, then yeah, we'll definitely be... cover that. Hopefully, we can even get a live feed, live footage of just. Yeah, just that should be game. possible to set up. Yeah. That'd be cool. Um, but we'll, we're still a few rounds away from, uh, from that taking place. And any any games that catch your eye? Yeah, I think the uh, Fernandez game is, is worth checking out because mm -hmm. again, I'm just looking for it's games a where there's a weak king basically, and mm -hmm. here Black's king is seems to be chilling in the center. Yeah, we do want to see some of these like attacking middle games. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something unusual. I think this is always the most interesting stuff. And this came from a Caro Khan, which uh, we looked at a while ago around pawn h6. Um, if we just see how play develops. Um, this is a very typical placement for the knights, where usually black wants to play c5 and then knight to c6. Um, so white played b4, restricting c5, yep. grabbing more space. Nice move. And now g5. Wow. g5. No thematic. Yeah, to, going to for g4, maybe bishop g7. On, um, either put the knight or the bishop on g6, knight comes to f5, mm -hmm. and then white doesn't ha or black doesn't have to worry about knight h4 ideas. Also, black is uh, one day uh, potentially playing in the castle queen side and just getting the king side play going. So, uh, yeah, I think very uh, typical move. Mm -hmm. um, so knight b3, uh, maybe freeing up the d2 square for the other knight. b6. b6 maybe considering at some point playing c5. Mm -hmm. a4, knight g6, bishop d2, slightly slow play. Now pawn f6. Wow, so black really trying to open up the king side. Yeah, I mean, this is very bold. Like, 2150 rated player doing the, and Daniel Fernandez, I believe, uh, international master, if I'm not mistaken. International master, yeah. Um, and, uh, I mean, just with the king in the center playing f6 is, is very bold, uh, mm -hmm. especially when white's rook can immediately come to e1. Yeah, it's dangerous because, like, if black wants to castle king side, or queen side, I should say, white already has, like, a yeah. nice setup for an attack with multiple... Uh, Pawn breaks. Absolutely. And if the center opens up, the king could be stranded with no safe place to go. Now c4, wow. So white has one connect four. <laughs> nice. And yeah, c4, I saw your, very your recent video <laughs> with that title. Oh, well, connect eight. Actually. Connect eight, yeah, exactly. That yeah, was, yeah. Uh, went viral for, uh, for a few days. That was, um, that was awesome. Um, but yeah, c4, I think it, it, it is thematic to try and open the center. Like, you, you just want to open up files and get to the black king and there's enough support uh bishop defends upon on c4 um there's ideas later of rook c1 and trying to open the c file maybe ideas of b5 yeah i mean it, is, it does seem to just be leaving the e5 pawn undefended maybe we can take a look at what would happen black just so black played e5. bishop g7 but yeah you do make a point that is this just a free pawn um and these positions just make my head hurt because there's so much pawn tension <laughs> and there's so many different lines to, to consider. Yeah. And there's a lot of times where you have to like pause and evaluate and, and judge like whether you choose material or initiative. Um, I mean, at first glance, it looks like there's some potential with bishop c3 ideas at some points. Mm -hmm. Like maybe start by taking with pawn and then knight takes yeah, like I think bishop this c3 here. Pretty typical pawn sacrifice. Yeah, either you get bishop c3, we also or have even knight d4. Knight d4. Or, exactly. Yeah, hitting the bishop and e6 is weak. It's like for one pawn, the position is opened up. Now black's position is like... And the e-file is half open, so at any point, yeah. any point rook e1. Um, so intuitively just feels like white has enough here. Yeah, and I think for, for a stronger player, like it's more about intuition rather than like 
very concrete calculation. Right. You, you see the ideas, you see the resources, and then you make your judgment without really like blowing your brains out. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a question. What rating were you, do you think, when you realized that like you could actually give up a pawn without knowing exactly how you're going to get it back with tactics? Mm. That you can just do it just for the sake of having slightly better pieces or a slightly better structure. When did you have that? That's a good question. Um, I mean, growing up, I was very materialistic. Okay. I had very kind of solid positional kind of defensive style. So I, I like to grab material and hold on to it. Mm. Um, and it, I probably like I don't remember one defining moment where I had some like magical epiphany, um, but it had to be like <laughs> until I was over two thousand. I see this mistake a lot, like among students and, and just amateur level players, where they they value material so much and they don't fully have the concept of of initiative or just peace activity and, and when that's relevant and when that can be more valuable than material. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is that like a lot of players, they they understand how to evaluate uh, concepts on the board and certain things like controlling an open file and peace activity and they can yeah. evaluate that, but then they evaluate material separately. And so one side could have all of the strategic advantages and the other side could be up a pawn and they'll still take the pawn that feels more concrete, more valuable. But in fact, um, I think these factors have to be evaluated side by side. Yeah, and it depends the on the thing. situation too. There, there can be very extreme examples where the decision is very clear. Right. But then there's more nuanced examples where it's not so clear and it, it can take a very strong player to make the right judgment. It, it certainly can be a matter of um, simply style if mm -hmm. it's kind of like a, a borderline case. Some players, uh, I think I would put myself in this category, I'd rather play a position where I'm down a pawn but I'm the one with creating the threats. Other players, they, they would rather hold on to the pawn and as long as they can consolidate then they'll have a big advantage. Right. So just a matter of um, how you want to play the game. And I mean, the everything we're talking about now kind of shows or kind of illustrates how stronger players beat weaker players is, is simply by understanding imbalances yeah. more effectively and knowing when to go for peace activity, when to go for material. And a lot of it comes down to experience and having kind of the intuition, like the sixth sense, um, but of course also concrete calculation. Mm -hmm. Um, so this line didn't occur. Bishop g7, maybe trying to keep the center as close as possible. Yeah. Um, okay, so the c-file opens. Rook c1 with tempo. Queen d8. So white's just trying to keep initiative, open the position. Uh, bishop takes f6, 95. Wow, 95. Look at this move. Just There's insisting. one defender and yeah. three attackers. Um, but I like it because it opens up possibilities of bishop h5. Oh yeah. Of course, if black ever takes, there will be ideas later of rook e1. Uh, it looks like a strong. I mean, we're we're not using the engine right now, so no. we don't really know for sure. But it looks like a very very nice move to play for the initiative. Not to mention, like this has a threat of knight c6, and this queen is um, almost trapped like, on its starting square. Uh, yeah. So bishop takes, pawn takes, knight f4. So not taking the pawn. <laughs> the pawn on e5. Yeah. Um, I think that makes sense. This one's really too dangerous. And black doesn't want the e-file to open and doesn't want this diagonal to open. So better just to leave the pawn where it is. Um, knight f4. Bishop takes f4. G takes f4. Current position. I really like white. I like the way Fernandez is playing this. Yeah, it just looks like, I mean, so many issues here for black. Rook's again disconnected. Bishop h5 check is yeah. probably already on the board. Knight d4 is coming, which, like, either white takes on f5 and black's position collapses, or white can take on e6 or play knight c6. So basically so many issues here for black that I, I think it's, uh, it's one of these positions, yeah, it's just like white just has all of the advantages. Um, Actually, one nice uh, trick that, that people can use when try to they're trying to evaluate positions is, let's say you're a pawn down and, and you want to see if you have uh, enough compensation or not. Mm -hmm. Well, just imagine that you weren't a pawn down. Just give yourself an extra pawn in the position. And then if you automatically just have a huge advantage, then it means you probably had some, some kind of uh, compensation. So here it's like material is equal and white is just crushing in all respects. Mm -hmm. So if we took the a4 pawn off the board, I mean, would we really think the evaluation is you know, all that different here? would still feel like yeah white and i'm curious how many pawns attack. we can take off for white where i white would give is up better. a4 b4 in a heartbeat just yeah. <laughs> h2 maybe <laughs> just 
No problem. Give up the e5 pawn, open the e file. I mean, black could, uh, okay, depending what white does, like the e5 pawn could hang. But um, I mean, I, I like what we're seeing with a lot of these games. We're seeing um, matchups with like big rating disparities where like stronger players are better in understanding the balances and, and knowing how to transform the position yeah. in their favor. Um, especially with uh, what was it the more Diabati game with pawn e4? Right. I think this game the key moment was uh, was pawn c4, um, just transforming the structure and opening the the position in uh, in his favor. But yeah, the c4 move it's just another uh, another great pawn break. Very instructive moment. Yeah, just seeing f6 and then responding with c4, just opening opening it up. We have a question from JC6213. Is a Rosen Center named after Eric Rosen? Uh, no. Um, but when I was checking in, I felt very special telling the, um, the hotel clerk that my last name is Rosen. Um, but I, I didn't really. Them. <laughs> I should have winked. I didn't really get much special treatment, but got my room, and that's what mattered. Should have, should have asked for your usual suite. <laughs> yeah, try and trick them off a little bit. Um, but yeah, this is my first time at the Rosen Center in Orlando. It's it's a great venue. Um, a lot of rooms designated for chess. A lot of side events happening. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to go into the tournament room, but I haven't seen it. it it's a very nice feeling walking into a, a room just full of chess players, and, and, uh, not, and not, not having to play chess, <laughs> but seeing people like so focused and stressed, and you can just kind of walk freely and mm -hmm. and look at the games. So let's yeah, move absolutely. on. Okay. So so any other games that catch your eye? Let's see. I think the game between uh, Hansen and, and Hungaski is uh, quite interesting. It seems like the games are... I, I don't see a game that's necessarily going to finish soon, so that's mm -hmm. nice. Whoa. We're going to have a little bit of time. But okay, this game looks insane. Yeah, Just, this is a very, very double-edged position here. This come from the, the Spanish position I we were so. discussing earlier. Yeah. Um, we just go back... Yeah, so I was explaining this earlier with the, this trap of knight takes e4, bishop d5. Of course, a lot of moves have been played. Um, so white did play bishop c2, preserving the bishop pair. And we had mentioned this line, mm -hmm. um, which they did play. So white basically undevelops the bishop to preserve the bishop pair, and then presumably will play b3 at some point to kick away the knight. Um, I was mentioning the move c5 in this position as a more direct strike. Right. Uh, knight d7 played, which maybe looks slightly unusual at first, just retreating the knight. But I would imagine the idea is just bishop f6. Bishop f6, c5, yeah. Was... Yeah, and then later c5 and try and get control over the e5 square. Yeah. So b3. Knight goes back. And now c5. Okay, so white kind of redevelops. Queen b1. Not the type of move that comes to mind like right away, but I guess it's multi-purpose. It gets out of the pin and forms this battery towards the king side. Mm -hmm. And black has to be like constantly aware here of these bishops having like potential X-ray vision against the king side pawns, especially with not so many defenders. Um, and at some point, white might just want to play e5. Yeah, just open it up. So knight of eight, okay, defending h7 h3, bishop h5, g4, wow. So I was showing this possibility in another variation. Right, that's right, yeah, but, just going uh, for it. Yeah, it makes some sense, just expand. And I know it's always a little bit unsettling when you when you go for h3, g4 as white when you've castled, because it seems like you might be weakening your king. And you are. <laughs> and you are, but in a case like this, it's not so weak if black can't attack you. In this case, black doesn't really have so many attacking resources, mm -hmm. at least right away. And white playing pawn to uh, to g4 chases the bishop back and may allow for uh, this maneuver knight f1, like the very typical Spanish maneuver of um, knight f1, knight g3 or e3, and then eventually knight f5. And uh, I can imagine that given that I, I did see the the current position mm -hmm. with a knight on f5. So I'm assuming that's what happened. But yeah, but I mean, this is a little bit different than your typical like closed Spanish, because mm -hmm. usually the center is closed and, and white has 
a lot of freedom to just play h3 g4 not worry about anything that's true like if, if there's a black pawn in e5 and white has played d5 then it's a slower sort of game yeah i mean white can can do it in these types of positions i mean as you were showing it's just a lot more risky because the center can still blow open and that definitely explains black's next move d5 just immediately yeah it's, it's interesting because black wants to strike when this knight is is on like it's worst square before it can enter the game mm -hmm. via g3 um and it's another position that just makes my head hurt it's just so much pawn tension like what move to consider first do you do you take the pawn do you push well um, dc5 looks like a huge canada move but yeah it can be double edged dc5 so opening up your bishop but allowing box bishop to enter the game right it's hard to judge but yeah I, I can also understand White's choice in the game e5. I like this just move, keeping yeah. the, the d4 square under control. And e5 just grabs space. Yeah. There's a rule in chess: if you have a well-supported pawn on e5 and you're White, um, it's a sign you should attack on the king side because it gives you space to to organize your your pieces. Yeah. Um, and in this case, uh, yeah, it opens up the bishop, and White, in some sense, closes down the center and, and will try and continue with this. Uh, Knight maneuver. So trade the bishops. Pawn c4. Interesting. Knight g3. Rook c8. So black is getting queenside play of his own. The only problem is there's no, like, white's king is super safe on g1. Right. And uh, there's no, like, eventual target to checkmate on the queenside. Yeah, this is very much like positional counterplay. Mm -hmm. Like, black wants to gain space, a5, maybe b4, c3. Get this like, monster protected pass pawn. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's super double edged because White still has these attacking chances on the king side. You can put the knife on f5 and uh, bring the rooks in. Maybe um, somehow getting uh, this knight on f3 somewhere would be would be nice so that the f, f pawn can even get going. Um, yeah, like uh, f4, f5 is, is also an idea. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we do see b4, imagining c3 coming soon. Queen e3. Knight e6. Yeah, he holds okay. off. Knight f5. Bishop f8. So if black can just kind of stay solid on the king side, not get mated, then the argument is some someday down the road, um, the queen side advantage should be should be very strong. Mm -hmm. um, if c3 is eventually played. But h4, a5, g5, a4. So both players kind of ignoring what the other's doing yeah. on their respective side and just going for their own attacks, their own pawn storms. Yeah, it feels like white castle queen side, like the way this position is being played out. <laughs> yeah, you imagine like a king is on b1 here. Right. Um, but I, I like this approach from black, like putting a lot of pressure. I like the fact that he didn't play c3 too early because now there's a lot of pressure on b3. Yeah, very interesting that he didn't commit to this. And like in some cases, you, you, leave, you're, you left the tension between these pawns because you might want to open the c-file. For example, black might have some idea of playing a3, mm -hmm. bishop c1, and then take on b3, and then plant the rook on c3. Mm -hmm. And that can be a lot more effective than having a pawn on c3, mm -hmm. where it's not really attacking much in the position. Um, but if you get your rook in, the c-file is open, you create some battery, it can very quickly lead to um, some attacks towards the king side and also some play in the center. Yeah, right now I'm liking black. Um... Because I, I just don't see the mate that mm -hmm. the white is setting up. But there are ideas for white. I mean, he can go king h2, rook g1, knight h6, check. Mm. And it's creative. It's scary, you know. Yeah. But it, it might not work. I mean, it's, I mean it's honestly, cool. a few moves ago, like going back to around this position, I was really liking white. Yeah. Because I thought the attack should be a lot more uh, kind of fluid. Mm -hmm. But over these last few moves, it seems like black is might be the first one grabbing initiative um but your idea is interesting like definitely white wants to open up some file on the king side get a rook to to g1 or h1 um but is it is it fast enough like king h2 a3 yeah black's initiative can come very quickly the question is is it even effective you know once once we get this rook on on the g file there's no way to get the queen over knight on e6 is covering f4 covering g5 White's queen is just has no way of getting from e3 to to yeah. g8. Let's say, <laughs> trying to get to the king. 
Yeah, you would like to teleport it somehow. Like if it were bug house, it would be completely different. But uh... yeah, yeah. Always, and there are very few positions where the evaluation is the same, both in regular chess and bug house. It's true. <laughs> I'm wondering. There's some other idea, um, maybe similar to your idea of maneuvering the knight to h2, g4, and then eventually sacrificing. Yeah. On h6 or f6. Absolutely. I think the problem with these ideas are just too slow, and. Like sometimes these attacks come down to who grabs initiative first. And if black can just start throwing punch after punch with a3, takes on b3, rook c3, I think uh, white can can suffer very quickly. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we'll, we'll definitely keep an eye on this one. Uh, let's see, going around horn. So there have been, what, a few games that have finished. The board one game ended in a quick draw few decisive games with the larger rating differentials. Mm -hmm. Andrew Tang winning, Moridi Abadi winning, um, but a lot of the games still underway. Um, any that catch your eye? Let's see, we, maybe we can go back to the Mikulevsky game. It's been a while since we, we took a mm -hmm. look at this one. Um, Whoa, okay, the Burnett game is also, also becoming very interesting, but okay. we'll come back to that one. Let's Yeah, let's try and evaluate this position, because this was one of these, like, Catalan games. We saw earlier actually, we saw I think the position after c5. Right. Where it's very double edged and black is up a pawn, white has a bishop pair, both sides with kind of ugly looking double pawns. Um, let's see what happens. Queen a4. Looks like a nice move. Double attack. Mm -hmm. At the same time, restricting b5, restricting any like knight b6 move because the knight's pinned. Um, so black castles, white regains the pawn, now b6. Seems like Black was happy to get back the pawn and now just tries to be solid. Wow, this next move. G4. Wow. G4, it's the type of move that I don't know if that would even cross my mind yeah, like, I mean, during is, the game. Is this Gareev's game? Like, what yeah. is happening? G4? Like, I would consider D3 or Bishop B2, which maybe will still be played later, but G4 right away. It's interesting. Like, Black's underdeveloped and White just wants to grab some attack. Yeah. And when you have a bishop, like in this case, white has a dark squared bishop. Black doesn't have a dark squared bishop. You want to use your bishop to its full potential. And Absolutely. I mean, the simple idea, kick away the knight, get well, your like, bishop to long Like you were saying and... about the, the imbalances here, it's like we have this classic imbalance. White has a two bishops. The dark squared bishop is the unopposed bishop. So the, the evaluation of the position comes down to whether this bishop will be strong. If it's strong, white is better. If it's not, black will be better with actually the, the fantastic structure. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think you're you're definitely right about the the plan. I mean, it's just to open open up this diagonal by kicking the knight off. Um, it, it's similar to you were saying about the structure when white gets upon an e5, you get the kingside mm -hmm. initiative because you control the f6 square and black can't put the knight. Well, here white wants to put the pawn on g5 to again get this advantage, but keep the diagonal open for the bishop. So it looks very uh, very uncomfortable for black. There's actually some conversation in the Twitch chat. Uh, Another idea being suggested for white, a4, mm -hmm. the idea of a5, which, yeah, has some positional uh, logic to it. But uh, I like, I honestly like Mikulevsky's idea more with just uh, the idea of attacking rather than and creating like small weaknesses. Um, yeah, but a, a4 might be some move to play like down the road mm -hmm. just to make some small improvements where you either get an a5 or you provoke black to play a5, which weakens b6. Yeah. So let's see what happened because it's been hey, shout out several to more moves. Some some of you guys joining us in the Twitch chat. I see Morphe's redheaded sheepdog, another great username. Some great names, yeah. Uh, F Green Mystery, welcome guys. Um, okay, so G five. Even though this doesn't attack anything, uh, maybe it, it frees open this kind of rank for the queen uh, to come closer to the king side. Ooh, slide over to H four. That's nice. So Queen C seven, a pawn E three. It's another move that I probably would not predict. Um, I don't, don't know if I understand this. Maybe it's more prophylactic where black's just preventing knight f4, queen f4, where you don't want things to simplify if, if you're going for an attack. Yeah, I, I, I think it could very well be the idea. Because yeah, queen c7, it seems like it's really just aimed to access the square, and knight f4 could especially be very annoying. Mm -hmm. um, so e3. Preventive bishop b7, bishop b2, rook f8, rook fc1. 
So focusing on the queen side, I was imagining maybe some more kingside play, but with the rook on c1, now there's this kind of c file battery, and the idea appears to be pawn d4. This pawn on c5 is somewhat pinned. Yeah, it's interesting. First he was playing g4, g5. Now mm -hmm. it seems like he's switching over to the queen side. He just wants to dominate like all areas of the board. Yeah, I, I think, well, maybe, okay, there's no direct way for white to give mate, so mm -hmm. he's just making some improving moves. He wants to see what black is going to do. And uh, for instance, you know, black's next move is, is to play e5, just completely changing the situation and now maybe giving white uh, different, uh, different ideas in the position based on this, this pawn push. Because now the dark square bishop ends up feeling a little bit shut down, but on the other hand, the knight on d5 is a little bit weakened, the light squares have opened up, now I get some bishop h3 ideas. Yeah, it's interesting. A move like e5, it makes one bishop sadder, but one bishop happier. Right. But strategically, and, it, it's kind of a correct move, because mm -hmm. black is playing against the unopposed bishop, which is what you should be trying to do. Mm -hmm. Now, if black could play f6 in the position safely, things would be great. But with white's pawn on g5, it's, it's almost never going to be safe. Yeah, the g5 pawn, it seems more of like a, a restrictive mechanism than anything else. Like, not really used to attack, but more just to restrict. And, um, yeah, it seems like the pawn on e5 and pawn or uh, knight on d5 are, are the clear targets. Um, now, white's next move confuses me a little bit. White played d3. d3. What does this do? Just preventing e4? Yeah, one idea may be stopping e4. Uh, I'm guessing he might want to go knight d2. Uh, and mm. go for this maneuver. Um, yeah, which he, would attack the knight and then ideas of knight e4 later. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he plays a lot of positions. One thing that he, he's played a lot is uh, the English opening, which mm -hmm. this now resembles. And so I, I feel like he's still feeling very comfortable in this position just with this nice, like, Fianchetto pressure from the two bishops. It's um, definitely, I think, uh, his style, his uh, type of position. So there's been a few more moves, knight e7. So getting the knight out of harm's way. Queen g4, and now knight to g6, which this looks a little bit fishy given yeah. that now, I mean, it just seems like white can go for h4, h5. Just asking, what yeah, is the knight doing on g6? And okay, if this were like a bullet or blitz game, I'm, I'm just blitzing out h4 and, and letting the pawns roll. Yeah, h4 would already be on the board. Maybe it is on the board. <laughs> it's possible, yeah. Um, I, I'm wondering, like, if h4 is played, does black have anything immediate? Like, there's no way black is going to. There is e4. Except the fact that knight has to move back. Oh, e4. Ah. Ah, so knight on, on g6 does unleash the rook. It's true. Yeah. Uh huh. So this would, this would be a very concrete. But e4 is very double edged because it's yeah. still. Because, yeah, again, reopening bishop. the, the dark square bishop. But at least creating some some play in, in the center, playing against White's queen now. Yeah, and this attack is kind of annoying. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure how to how to evaluate this. I mean, there um, is it I possible don't for White to play get, h5? I yeah. was thinking <laughs> about that too, because the the problem is after h5 takes a bishop's attack. Right. And I mean, it's something to calculate if you're White. Like takes takes. It seems like there's not enough compensation, unless I'm missing something. But there could be, there could be ideas here. But if there's nothing, then then it you, you need like just enough fuel. Yeah. Um, so there's there's a few I mean, forces. For, for example, let's let's try g takes uh, h7 check. King. I mean, I could play king h8, but okay. Let's I'll just play king h7. Yeah, for argument's sake, queen okay. h5 check, and rook c4. Ah, so sometimes this kind of thing can work. Usually it doesn't, but uh, can be dangerous if black doesn't doesn't figure something out mm -hmm. very quickly. Yeah, but we, you but we point. should point out that king takes h7, of course, was not forced. Maybe king h8 is just a lot safer with the extra piece already. Yeah, you use uh, the h-pawn as a shield to, to protect the king. And now the, the ideas of, of mating the king along the h-file is uh, just non-existent with a pawn on h7. Right. And it is hard to get to g7. Um, okay, play is unfolding pretty rapidly. Uh, let's go back to the main line. So queen g3, ah, so queen g3 played in this position. Nice. Um, instead of h4, which we were analyzing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, which typical pins grandmaster e move. I don't want to calculate h4, e4, so mm -hmm. let me just pin your pawn 
I still have h4 in the position. That's true. You figure out what to do. I, I feel like this is maybe a difference between like grandmasters and lower level players, where GMs they kind of they know not to to get into these like rabbit holes where they're calculating um, these crazy lines, yeah. but rather play a simple move where you still have the same ideas, but you avoid just any unnecessary complications. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Um, I think. Uh, yeah, a lot of players, they just kind of waste time in their calculation, calculating something that they're never going to end up playing anyway because it's way too risky. And, and GMs are so good at just like taking one look at a move and just being like, yeah, that's not going to work. And, and they just, they look for something else. So now it's it's interesting battle because white, white pinned the pawn, black defends the queen. So still clearly um, considering e4. And then rook to d1. Rook d1, seemingly prophylaxis against e4. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, are you sure you want to play this move and let me open up my rook? And uh, Zhang doesn't back down. He just, just yes, plays it. yes, I do. Thank you very much. I need I to mean, get some some. It seems to work tactically. Like the, um, I mean, the knight on d7 is a clear target, but uh, whenever White opens the the d file, let's say it takes bishop comes into e4, hitting the rook. The knight's always defended. Like even if you trade queens. Um, it's still defended. Black has initiative, and if this transitions to an end game, I think, um, I think Black will just have better structure. Like this pawn's overextended. These double pawns are just grotesque on the. the no, queen strategically, side. it just feels like Black is up a pawn or two here, mm -hmm. just because the structure is so much healthier. And um, yeah, White's dark square bishop, okay, it's pretty, but without an attack on the king side, actually not that effective in this position. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this would be actually a dream for Black. Yeah, I like to call this bishop a decoration. Yeah, like it, it looks pretty, but it has no like function. No function, exactly. So. Okay, so e4 is the current position. Mikulevsky thinking. And like, a lot if of the clock is correct, then Mikulevsky is heading into deep time pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, I think John Hartman mentioned Mikulevsky was one of the players that. Uh, Showed up late to, to the round, uh, so he, he might have been down a little bit on time. I think he's also just a player and, who yeah. gets into time trouble a lot. Um, I played him a few years ago at Chicago Open, and remember, he got pretty low on time. Eventually beat me, um, but I, I had some hopes when he was in, in time pressure. Um, and we should remind everyone, he, he is a grandmaster, so a few hundred points higher rated than his opponent. But uh, we do have to give some kudos to, to Chao Zheng. Really not backing down and playing a very interesting game yeah, so I, far. Yeah, I, I definitely like how he's uh, how he's playing. Mm -hmm. So let's move on. Um, keep bouncing around between games. Uh, if you're in the chat or if you're in real life and you have games that you want us to cover, let us know. Um, there's yeah. one game that we in the saw meantime, the opening. We should of. look at the Burnett game. I think. Okay. It's really yeah. heating up. But then, absolutely, we can we can take suggestions. Oh, from this the is chat. Burns. I saw Burn and thought it was Burnett. Okay. So this is board three. Whoa. So these players are doing really well, both on five out of six. I thought this game was going to be like pretty dry. Because <laughs> we last saw like some very closed structure. Yeah. Where I thought things were just going to trade off. But somehow Black is creating play. Um, so F3. F3 is interesting, kicking away the knight. But... We have to keep in mind pawns can't move backwards. Yeah. So after knight f6, bishop f1. Which was f1. actually discovered by Grandmaster Sam Shanklin. He was the first one to... Uh... <laughs> he wrote a whole book on it, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. First one to introduce this concept into... <laughs> He's given a few lectures for the St. Louis Chess Club, which are named like pawns can't move backwards. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a simple concept, but like it's it's important to realize like how deep that can be. Or, yeah, you, you give your opponent <laughs> really like nice. potential pawn breaks, or you weaken some squares. No, but his book is actually, I think, very, very instructive. Mm -hmm. Has anyone here read that book or have it? Nice. Oh, nice. Yeah, I think it's been really, really doing well so far. So going forward in this game, uh, still some slow play, and then we see h5. So going for some pawn break, h4. And especially with black having the only dark sword bishop on the board, it makes sense to try and weaken the, the dark squares in white's position. Yeah, super principle. I think it's interesting how we started with knight d7 before playing h5. I mean, it looks mm -hmm. a little bit counterintuitive. Yeah, you imagine h5 should be played with the knight here. Yeah, you're playing on the king side. Mm -hmm. Maybe he was uh, trying to stop knight c5, maybe keeping his opponent's ideas in mind. Makes uh, some sense. Didn't yeah. want to allow this 
Um, or maybe he's opening up the queen. I'm not not totally sure. Also, say it's flexible. Like you, yeah. okay, you have three pieces on c5, so knight c5 is not an option. Right. There's also ideas of e5. Yeah. So perhaps depending what white plays next, you decide do you go for e5 or do you go for h5. Right. Or, I mean, this position. There's so many potential pawn breaks. There's ideas of g5, g4, um, f5, g5, f4. So, like, all the pawns on the king side have potential breaks. Mm -hmm. A lot to consider. So let's go forward here. Because white is really trying to undermine this bishop with f4. Mm -hmm. Knight comes back. Ah, so now these, uh, these squares are, um, are glaring holes in, in white's position. Yeah, it just comes back. You Knight played f2. f4. Thank you very much for the square. Mm -hmm. And here we go. Yeah, and it seems like white is just trying to hold on for dear life. Mm -hmm. uh, puts the knight to... Uh, Kind of counteract the the nine on f six. Now g six. G six is interesting. It's one of the, like these slow moves, but has a clear plan of perhaps king g seven, rook h eight, and h four. Yeah, classic example of do not hurry. The Soviet school principle, where like okay, you you have pressure with black. I mean, you could play h four. There's probably nothing wrong with it, but mm -hmm. there's also nothing wrong with just like waiting a move and forcing your opponent to make a move. I mean. White hasn't really improved this position that much. I mean, he's played this like f4, which I, I don't love because it's just giving away all these squares. But um, yeah, just giving the opponent another chance to, to do something while yeah making this micro improvement. Maybe king g7, rook h8 will happen one day. Maybe not, but, but white is the one who has to kind of worry about it now. And I'm not really seeing much active play for white. Like there's no clear weaknesses to attack. There's no real penetration points. I think we kind of see this with White's next move, Rook C2. Mm -hmm. like even if White doubles up, like all these squares are controlled in Black's position, so I think White's just kind of waiting yeah. for the breakthrough. So H4, Queen D3. So let's zoom ahead a bit here. Ah, so now the Queen enters uh, the position. Mm -hmm. So I guess this is a one penetration square, Queen B5, uh, which does attack the A pawn. Rook A8. Very patient. Wow. Everything's still defended for black. Knight c1. Uh, so leaving this knight on f2 to restrict these squares and perhaps going for knight c d3 and knight e5 or knight c5. So it's it's getting sharp. Like both sides have their own ideas. Takes takes. Knight h5. So black striking with some initiative. Um, g3 is now the clear target. And now this next move from white. Is just so so ugly. Um, it's it's sickening to just see White have to play this knight h1. Yeah, it's so sad just to defend the pawn. I'm curious why not like king I mean, g2. Sometimes knight h1 is like an amazing move. Nim Nimzovic had this famous mm -hmm. game where he played. I think it was from knight g3 to h1 with the intention of improving the knight to f2 h3 g5. But you're playing knight h1 just to hold on to a pawn. Yeah, and that's here the only like you're not you don't have some genius maneuver. No, it's very much a passive passive move, last resort kind of thing. I mean, if the board was like longer, maybe you could move to like J2 and then back to H3. But um, okay, maybe there's there's some additional idea. You are unleashing the rook along the second rank. Mm -hmm. And yeah, maybe at some point G4. Um, so maybe white can kind of, uh, kind of like unleash yeah, some here. pieces and then, okay, later knight G3. So, okay, there's some logic to it, I guess. Um, but black continues trying to pound away. Pawn g5. Absolutely. Another pawn break. Yeah. Uh, rook h2. This is just black maximizing the power of the dark squared bishop. Yeah. I mean, pushing the pawn in front of his king, but okay, strong players always know when these rules don't really apply in the position because here white just has no good way to take advantage. The queen is kind of stuck on on b5 you know actually at first I, I saw this move rook a8 and i was like wow i mean not passive but like okay he's like really slowing down mm -hmm. but uh i think it it's this thing that i feel like it was steinitz who first kind of came up with this the, the idea of economic defense you have this queen attacking the pawn sure my rook is super passive on a8 but what about your queen it's doing mm -hmm. the same work as my rook so as far as this kind of trade-off black is kind of ahead you know in terms of which piece is pulling uh, more more work here I, I really like the way Black's playing this. Like very patient. A lot of these moves, you don't, you wouldn't always see it like an amateur level where it's it's not going for the kill right away, but improving, restricting the opponent. And now yeah. now the knight simply comes back to f6. And keep in mind, he's 
these holes still exist. Right. No, I, I absolutely fall into this trap where I feel like, oh, I'm playing for the initiative, so every move has to be uh, uh, going forward aggressive, not mm -hmm. backing down, not defending anything. But many cases, okay, you have to be patient. Uh, even Kasparov, the great attacker, he would make these like famous little king moves where he just improves his king before going in for the final kill. Be very, very important uh, in attacking chess to, to make mm -hmm. these kinds of moves. Okay, but I, I'm guessing we both really like black here. I mean, in the live position, just like yeah, white's king seems very, very weak. And we don't know the exact like time. We don't know if the clocks are accurate, but there are uh, five move, more moves to make until players get additional time. Mm -hmm. um, but clearly a, a very difficult situation for white. Um, number of resources for black. Um, I mean, knight g4 attacks a rook and a pawn. Knight e4 and just controls so many squares. There's bishop a6 ideas perhaps at some point. There's yeah. rook g8, king f8. Um, perhaps at the right time to attack along the g file. With all these arrows, white should be terrified. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, maybe we should do a quick, I don't know, just overview of okay. some of the games and maybe we can take a little break as well. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. So perhaps towards the top of the leaderboard. Mm -hmm. So board one has already been drawn between Grandmasters uh, Brizone and Nizhnik. So they were on five and a half out of six. Now they're both out of uh, six out of seven. Now I will pull up the, the standings here just for a moment. Nice. Um, I know live audience uh, text is pretty small, but hopefully on, on Twitch people can, can see the names clearly. Um, so just uh, to show, um, wait a minute. Oh, so going into round seven, there were five players with five and a half out of seven. John Fedorowicz took a bye, um, which brings him to six. Mm -hmm. Nizhnik and uh, Bruzon drew, so they also now have six out of seven. Um, the board two game between Swirts and Gureyev is still underway. Yeah, and apparently um, only 16 moves deep, that. which is pretty few. Mm -hmm. Gureyev is the one thinking, huh? Oh, wow. So the Gureyev is the one burning a lot of clock in this game. Oh, okay. So he's, yeah, I see. He's up on the clock giving some back. Oh, really? Oh, 20 to 15. Okay. The lead chess clock is like, yeah, way off. <laughs> it's actually, I'm, I'm looking at the position. And it's, it's really funny how we predicted... The plan, many uh, many ages ago. That's true. But black is a, we we thought white was going to do it. Black did it. The, black the is Pillsbury the one that attack. executed the Pillsbury attack. Like yeah. we were we were discussing all these moves, but for white, and somehow black was was quicker to get the knight to e4. Even got the queen to h6, and now um, it seems like there's some similarities between this game and the game we were just looking at. Uh, between Burnett and uh, Dragoon. In terms of the structure. With, yeah. with the structure of the bishop being undermined by white's pawns, but there's ideas of the pawn breaks. I wouldn't be surprised if like G5 comes soon. Maybe this, this knight can come in to, to G4. And this knight on G2, it's such a weird piece, like just fee and kettled. Um And it doesn't do a great job of defending H2 or H3. So if white, or if black does get a knight to G4, it can be pretty troublesome for white to defend. Yeah, if you encounter knights are typically not great, it does kind of ask for g5 to be played just to take, take like the f square yeah, away from knights. just completely restricts a knight. Mm. So I imagine white should still be solid, but it, it does look actually quite dangerous now for white because if, if there's no immediate counterplay and white has to play like f3 at some point. Mm -hmm. Which is maybe the purpose, like if we just back up a few moves. Mm -hmm. g3 was played, okay, of course to stop mate, and then Queen to h6, knight to uh, g2, it defends e3, so maybe has some idea of playing f3. Yeah. But it seems like f3, it's just, it's weakening to e3, and I don't think that there's so many scenarios where white wants to play e4. So let's imagine f3, knight f6. Oh, this pawn is hanging. Here, though. the pawn is hanging, yeah. So. Ah. So maybe knight g5? Mm hmm. But black just has so many pieces directed at e4, yeah, and like especially that. with the rook coming to e8. Yeah, looks very pleasant for black. Yeah, and uh, Mason, 1983, asked about knight g5. I think that's definitely a move that black should keep in mind in these types of positions, because 
number one threatens That's maiden true. two. And that is very check. true. Uh, this is always to be taken seriously. And uh, yeah, it kind of asks white to play a move like h4, which can be further weakening. h4 just allows more potential pawn breaks of g5. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I kind of feel like, okay, objectively, maybe it should still be okay for white, but yeah, they're, we've heard they're down on the clock now, maybe yeah. 20 versus 15 or something, so it could could be very, very, uh, a lot of action next sure. few moves. So I think now is a good time to take a break, and we'll be back very shortly with more coverage from the 2019 U.S. Open. Thanks, guys. Stay with us.
and we are back with more coverage from round what round is it seven round seven from of the US, US Open Open in uh, Orlando Florida and a lot of exciting games still underway uh, the game I currently have up is a game that we were looking at before the break and it was a very sharp battle very sharp pawn storm 
Um, a lot of the moves have been played since we last left. If we go back to see what happened, um, I think we saw the position after Black played a4. Right. Um, anticipating some a3 ideas, some taking, rook c3 ideas. White played very like, calm move, just rook a d1. Rook a d1? Makes some sense if the bishop's going right. to go back to c1. You don't want your rook stuck in the corner. Keeping them connected. And I, yeah, so bishop a1 being suggested, but I would imagine if, if a3, bishop a1, c3 looks really ugly for the bishop. Yeah. Ah, uh, some, okay, so some idea of taking, even still here, the bishop is just completely trapped. And it, it's essentially as if white is, uh, is down a piece. But it does hold, yeah. It's, um, okay, so some interesting possibilities. Uh, okay, after rook a d1, oh, this was played. But a3 not played. So it'd be interesting if, if white would go for bishop c1 or a1. Yeah, very interesting that he doesn't lodge the pawn in to get a protect passer, but just takes on b3, indicating that he wants the c4 square more than he wants a protected mm -hmm. pass pawn. Which... Yeah, I mean, bishop a1 has some logic. Like, if you just discourage rook a3, even though you're kind of down a bishop, yeah, the bishop is buried, um, so it's there is more opportunity risky. to attack on the king's side. Let's move forward because black okay keeps some some more open lines. Queen takes b3, queen d7, uh, knight goes back. So queen d7 was probably threatening some discovery. Probably knight takes g5 is a, the main threat. Uh, so knight g3, knight f4. Very very dangerous. Black uh, tables are kind of turning. Like black is. Or just kind of continuing the momentum. Well, we're finally seeing White's kingside advances kind of come back to to bite him here a little bit. Again, pawns can't move backwards, so yeah. a lot of uh, a lot oh, of man, if, squares. If G five G two was a move here, wow, what a strong move that mm. would be! But it doesn't work like that. And we should note the, the simple threat is Queen H three, where G two is actually undefendable, and this is not an easy move to stop. No, not at all. I really like this next sequence of moves, though. So e6. Yeah. Interesting to like obstruct the queen, try and uh, free open the e5 square potentially for the knight. It's like a yeah common like positional sacrifice idea. Mm -hmm. Black takes with the rook. White goes knight e5, and then black returns the favor and immediately bam takes on e5. It's all about looks nice. To, it, it's uh, just about initiative and yeah. yeah, get the queen to the mating square. We were talking about like bug house or teleportation earlier, um, where you, sometimes you, you want to get your queen to a very specific square, and in this case, there's a very clear path. Um, after takes queen g4, ah, so queen h3 right away is probably met with queen f3. Right. So queen g4, let's keep in mind, blocks down the exchange. I guess queen g4 just maybe attacking the pawn on h4. Yeah, threatening queen h4, maybe threatening some knight h3 check. Uh, yeah, I actually really like the move queen g4 because mm -hmm. uh, player playing white here, Hansen, is in huge time trouble, has five moves to go. So queen h3, queen f3, it's like he can make this move easy, but queen g4, white no longer has an easy move and has to figure out what to do uh, without allowing uh, himself to get mated. So if, yeah, if you make some random move and he might allow queen h3 under much, much stronger circumstances. Sure. And... I mean, not to mention there's ideas of bishop c5. Yep. Just bring another piece into play. Pin the f2 pawn. f pawn's a target. It would be pinned and not necessarily defending the knight. Um, I'm actually wondering if we just go back one move. This idea just came to mind. Rook c3. Yeah, rook c3. I was just thinking. And we're not, we're not using the engine, so mm -hmm. I, I have no idea if this, this could just be blunderous. But after, yeah, it's a double exchange sacrifice, exactly. Yeah, amazing idea. After bishop takes c3, then queen h3. And, how does white and we've get obstructed out of white's queen from covering f3. Does white have any defense here? There's like one move to not get mated, but that's, I mean, it's just losing. Yeah, it's actually very interesting. Why didn't he play rook c3? I mean, he, he, it's he the type of move you should see. It seemingly has a lot of time. I mean, super strong GM. I mean, with queen g4, rook c3 is still a huge threat. Uh, like takes and queen f3 
Maybe that sure. was one of his ideas. But yeah, very puzzling why he didn't just do this right away. I wonder if we're... I mean, is this just winning by force? Because like queen something. takes... Oh, queen can't even take on b4. No, there are no moves. I think it's just the miss. I mean, we can... Just a miss, yeah. We can ask There's the, no taking on d5. Oh, is there e6? Engine. There's e6, I think. E6? Right? Because oh. you, the rook's still hanging now. The queen's hanging. Wow, what a shot! I didn't even have to ask the engine. Did we take the queen? But we take the queen, and now we're threatening to promote. And black's still down material. Let's not forget. Yeah, and black queens are off the board. The pawn and it's incredible. incredible. So the bishop. Um, well, I mean, but in, but in the game, game, Black is still, you know, threatening to give mate. So I think maybe he wants to keep more attacking chances rather than have to. It's a fascinating position because, like, you, you have an idea that you want to play. Your opponent has a defense. So you prevent it with kind of this, um, this in-between move. Right. Um, but then White does the same thing. You want to take the rook, but you can't. So you have another kind of in-between move. Yeah, E6 is a very um, nice find. Yeah, it's just uh, just counterattacking. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, just block, like uh, block the lines. So, so okay, queen g4 probably justified, and probably not a miss. Like he he probably saw all of that. Yeah. He saw rook c3. He saw e6. Yeah, e6. No determined good. that okay, you don't want to like simplify or trade queens. Start with queen g4. Keep all the tension. Now rook c3. And now is actually rook c3 is a threat because there's no more e6. Yeah. So this is probably just a much stronger threat than what we had initially. Uh, said as queen takes h4. And what does white do here? Well, white played rook d4. Rook d4 played? Uh, which does deal with the rook c3 threat. Oh, uh, because you want to just. Because yeah, on, now for rook yeah. c3. I mean, rook c3 you take, just take, yeah. And then queen f3 take on f4. Mm -hmm. So bishop c5 looks very natural, like develop with tempo essentially. Right. And. I wouldn't be surprised if White gives back the exchange because this knight just seems way more valuable than a rook, and like White doesn't want to move the rook back, or does he? You move play rook d1 here. Just seems like a waste of time. But there's no well, knight rook h3 check is just very, very uncomfortable for White. Ah, uh, because f2 is uh, yeah lacking defense. Yeah, this looks very promising for black. Yeah, I'm guessing he has to take on f4 and just give back the exchange. And if, if takes, takes. What's material? Black's up a pawn and has just beautiful position and initiative, like attacking f2. Yeah. Queen's tied down to defending g3. Black basically has just like every positional advantage possible. Yeah. Better pieces, better structure, coming with tempo. better king, everything. Yeah. yeah. I'm imagining like rook f1 and then like knight c4. Uh, ideas of knight d2, knight f3. Oh, and black is up a pawn. And black's up a pawn. So this position yeah. is just a pleasure to look at yeah. for black, yeah. Was there a threat though? Uh, do I have to take the knight on f4? Or can I play like knight f3, knight f4, So the other option is to allow bishop takes. Take but then we're, we're leaving the knight, which no, is actually, arguably this is, a dangerous piece. This is what white piece. did. I mean, he played queen d1, just... Ah, queen d1? With, with this idea? It's funny, black doesn't even take the rook. Black just takes on h4. This is the game, yeah. Because um, in some sense, the rook is pinned to the pawn, which would be pinned to the king. So there's so much alignment here. And if the rook were to retreat to a square like d2, then queen takes g3. It's, it's just over. game over. So, yeah, the rook can be taken at any point. Yeah, I mean, I think at this point, uh, black is just up two pawns. We'll at any point win back the exchange. G5 also hanging. I think this is just yeah. dead lost. And not to mention the time situation where if it's accurate, I mean, there's just white's flagging too. So Yeah, very difficult move for white. Did you mention even rook takes f4 is not bailing out? Uh, rook takes f4, queen takes g3. Yeah, That's nice. You get this one as It's well. very nice. Um, maybe we should... Jump back to that uh, Gareyev game, because this one is really heating up. Yeah, so the Gareyev game, we actually saw on break, there was very interesting development. Uh, let's just go back, because we saw the position with knight g2. We were criticizing this knight for being 
just a, a weird, ugly piece. Mm -hmm. And then after pawn f5, white did go for f3. Right. And we had looked at this earlier. We were thinking knight g5, and black has some nice play, like rook a8, and, and try and pressure the e pawn. Uh, but black played a very unexpected move here which I'm still trying to wrap my mind around. Pawn g5. Yeah, I love these types of moves. Just But leaving the knight undefended. Just leaving the knight. This is what we call a passive sacrifice. So an active sacrifice is when you take something. Bishop takes h7, right. bishop takes g7. You really force your opponent to recapture. This is just a passive sacrifice. Your opponent attacks something, you just leave it undefended, and uh, you're saying go ahead and, and take it. So then game grave didn't immediately take on e4, but we should try to figure out why exactly he, he didn't take. It's not like his bishop gets trapped on, on d3. Yeah, but I'm still a bit confused. It's not even clear how black yeah, recaptures. It seems like the, the ball is in black's court to, uh, um, to crash through with some attack. Maybe the idea was maybe to take with um, the... With other pawn. The d pawn. And play f4. Uh, no, I'm thinking bishop c2 and then mm -hmm. just knight f6. Just trying uh, to play knight g4. Uh huh. And just saying that uh, white pieces, especially the bishops, just have a hard time dealing with this attack. I mean, it's a insanely complicated piece sacrifice, but I'm guessing. No, it's this interesting because h2 is a clear target, and there's no great way to defend it. Like you can't really play h3, h4. Yeah, h4, knight g4. It's just terribly anyway. weakening. E3 is also a target. It's weird because knight f6 is not the first sort of move that looks like so scary because white has a few moves to try and defend, but perhaps this is just uh, just overwhelming for white. Yeah, which might explain why he just goes bishop c2 without taking on on e4. So basically, just acknowledging like, okay, that looks pretty dangerous. Good job. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to leave your knight on e4 for now. I guess he he wants to keep the pawn at f3 to restrict the knight the um, other knight from coming into g4 mm -hmm. okay knight df6 yeah just keeping the piece there wow what a move i mean and now the knight on e4 is just not going back just has no no moves anymore oh i feel like this is just a amazing example of the pillsbury attack yeah like all the arrows we drew earlier are coming true <laughs> for the black side where like this is basically the signature setup in any Pillsbury attack. That's true. Maybe rook a8 coming at some point. And it's amazing that black can do this even after white has played this move f3. Yeah, very, very interesting stuff. I mean, we should mention both players here have, uh, I think, somewhere in the range of 20 minutes, maybe less, to make like 20 more moves. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I think less than 20 minutes. So this is going to be, this is going to heat up very, very quickly. Now, the next move for white is just hilarious. <laughs> like, it's just, it's just such a random nothing move. What is this B for? Like all the actions on the king side, and you you just move upon. Oh, he wants to play bishop B three yeah, maybe. Uh, okay, I think he's, okay maybe there's some fighting purpose for, for counterplay. Um, but D five, it's it, it feels it's awfully slow. But how exactly is black gonna break through if, mm -hmm. if white just simply? Yeah, we're gonna find out pretty soon. Yeah, Timur is asking the question. He's just like, okay, I've I've made enough moves on the king side. <laughs> I'm not gonna touch mm -hmm. anything else. Not going to touch that knight on e4 and allow knight g4. If black plays knight g4, then white will probably take that knight and, and most likely get away with it. Yeah, I mean, black really wants to get through to, to h, the h2 pawn. Um, and moves are coming in pretty quickly. Queen h3 played. I'm imagining some, it could be a slow idea, but very possible to get a rook to h6 somehow. So either like zigzag up the board or remove the knight and then play rook f6 to h6. And we always have to keep in mind that like white has so few ways to defend the h2 pawn. Uh, I see the question in the chat, uh, what is a Pillsbury attack? Uh, maybe someone who wasn't watching uh, earlier. Um, but yeah, it is worth probably Googling. Absolutely. Um, but essentially this, this sort of setup um, Pillsbury was, was known for. Um, and it's usually something you see from the white side. Right, mainly referring to the super strong knight on e4 being backed up by d5 and mm -hmm. f5, or from white's point of view, you would get the knight to e5. And usually this leads to uh, a pretty serious uh, attack on the uh, on the king side. And uh, definitely no, no, um, no surprise here that, that black is just going for it. So we have b4, queen h3. 
Ah, and, so uh, b4, queen h3. I like this move, just getting the queen closer. Mm -hmm. No way to challenge this queen from, from white's point of view. Uh, funny, even if you tried king h1, knight g1, you would uh, blunder the, the g3 pawn with the So you're saying in, in this position, mm -hmm. let's say king h1, yeah, this would be a pretty hilarious way to finish the game. <laughs> Smothered mates to the king. Um, so this is probably why Maybe queen informs, one is played. Yeah, and Gurea's next move is he wants to, to kick this queen out of h3 one day. I mean, defending g3, so maybe he can actually accomplish this maneuver. And now rook e8. It's amazing how many moves black is just leaving the knight attacked by the pawn. Um, and this would drive me crazy, like... Pretty much every move, you you have to consider what happens if if f takes e4. Right. I think now it's it's pretty simple that uh, there's always going to be knight g4 present in in the position. Um, I see we do have a question from uh, from the chat uh, from Buddy t313 asking about a potential idea to play knight g4. Yeah. F takes g4 and then bring the other knight in, um, which is interesting. And I don't see anything immediately wrong with it. Like we can even imagine in this position, knight g4 board, yeah, take. takes knight f6, and then black black gets two move two more moves for free. Mm -hmm. It's mate. So the question is, how does black or how does white not get mated here? It's not such an easy question to answer. I mean, there, we could give back some material with with knight to f4, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not sure if that's really going to be solving all of white's problems here. It's oh, there's bishop takes f5, actually. Oh, bishop f5, yeah. Just, yeah. just defending this get one. Get the bishop in. Right. So black has to be a little bit careful, not get too reckless. Um, but okay, rook a8. Rook a8. It seems like white's just suffering here. So how many moves do you think until someone either takes on e4 or this knight moves over under, let's say, five and they're, moves? They're only on move 20, so they have... I mean, they're both getting a bit low on time, and they have... 20 more moves to play until they get additional time right so things could get like even crazier no they quickly. absolutely are, are about to explode under over four. under over four four moves until what do you yeah, yeah yeah so right now the i'm, I'm trying to calculate like moves. specific variations <laughs> like what uh i mean black has points. just made his last improving move rick a8 there's like <laughs> Where else to go from here? H5, you know, King G7. So well, I point. assume Black, I mean, Black wants to improve further, like still get a Rook to H6, maybe Rook E6 at some point. Mm. Rook E6. Um, yeah, and White might go for very like King H1, Knight G1, if possible. But then there's ideas of like Knight H5 and then taking on G3, yeah. have both Knights targeting G3. Yeah, well, I, I really like the way that uh, Black is playing this, so yeah, really, really, especially against Gareev, who's like sometimes it's hard to like control him. But uh, it seems like all of White's pieces are are just depressed. I can't imagine he's happy. Yeah, here with with his position because mm -hmm. I think he's usually Gareev is usually the one who wants to be on the attacking side. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let me check real quick. Maybe we have some some sharp stuff going on. We do have a result in the Fernandez game. Okay, yeah, let's um, take a which at we that. were looking at earlier. Uh, board number nine. Uh, this was a game resulting from a, a Carol Khan where we were just loving White's position. Mm -hmm. um, I think this was a game with a C4 move, like very explosive. Mm -hmm. uh, Black's king never quite found safety. Um, yeah, this was a position I was having such a fun time just drawing all these arrows. Highlighting Black's weaknesses. So Bishop H5. Let's just see how the game finished off. H4. Nice move. Trying to deflect the queen away from defending the bishop. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's actually no safe square the queen can move to to defend the bishop. So after Queen G8, Knight takes F5. Black has to recapture with the pawn. And this just looks horrendous for Black. I mean, the rook's just not in play. The queen on g8, the king on f8. This pawn is weak. Yeah, it's hard to watch, to be honest. I mean, you want yeah. to look away, but you just can't. e6 is a threat. And white just having so much fun. Yeah, just every move feels like a punch in the face. <laughs> e6, 
He even gives away g2. That's a nice touch. Like, okay, if white's not getting mated, then it's okay. Well, King h1, so calm. And take on f5. Ouch. Yeah, yeah white just, just had too much. Collapsing. But very nice game, very instructive. Yeah. Way nice, in which nice game. he opened the position from kind of a close situation, got initiative, and black just didn't really have much time to consolidate. Yeah, so Fernandez, he was on also on five points out of uh, out of six. He moves up to six out of seven. Mm -hmm. Could potentially be tied for the lead, but it seems very likely we're going to get a decisive result on, on board two. I mean, this Garay of Swartz game is just... So, I mean, it has all the makings of a, of a decisive game. Super sharp. Nobody has any time. Both players are I, mean, I have to put my to money on, on Swirts, given the way that he's playing so far. Yeah, I gotta, like, black in that position. And if, if Swirts yeah. wins the game, he'll be in clear first. He's clear first. With six and a half out of seven. Yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure he has switched this federation to the U.S. because he already played the U.S. championship mm -hmm. at least once, so... Uh, he's definitely vying for that like instant qualification. Now he's uh, could be a favorite if he ends up winning this game, especially with black, because that means the next game you it's get white, true. you're super comfortable, and uh, everyone is going to be chasing. Um, all right, let's see. What else so we can we go down to our, our multi-board view, and just a reminder for the viewers, if you're just joining us, you can watch the live broadcast uh, in the, the link in the chat, leechess.org. Um, they should be promoting it too if you go to just leechhouse.org slash broadcast, um, which mm. brings you to all the games. Let's check out the... Switch um, to full window here. The mid-cop game and when we're back. We'll find uh, the multi-board view here. Um, so these are the games still going. If we look at the mid game, whoa. Mid-cop has a queen, but Justin Paul has... A rook in the night for it with active rooks. Um, yeah, we saw this game earlier. It was a fascinating position. And then we, we step away for some time and it's completely transformed. At first glance, okay, if white's not getting mated, I would like white's chances. Sure. But Who what's would? going on here? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have uh, we have a pretty... Pretty serious material imbalance. I mean, queen for for rook and knight, but it seems like white I feel is like also we should, up a pawn. We should go back and just see how this happened. Yeah, let's see how the, the queen sacrifice happened. Try and go through quickly. So this is a position around where we left off. I was drawing all the arrows for the ideas. Yeah. Um, so white played bishop f4. Rook takes f4 was, I guess, slightly unexpected. Not our first choice. Yeah. And pawn takes. Okay, so some strategic battle, and now knight b6. Nice move. Using the pin along the a-file. After rook b8, white just simply trades, and now there's a nice uh, nice target on a7. Um, looks very logical. Takes. White wins the pawn. Black going for some active play. Like, there's a couple weak pawns for white between b2 and e4. Yeah, strategically, black definitely has some compensation here, because... Black's two pawns on the queen side hold off white's three pawns. E4 pawn is isolated. E5 square is quite nice. Knight on E2 is passive and, and strange. Yeah. So not so easy here for white. So queen D4. I like this decision. Defend both pawns and just try and trade Let's queens and game get game. to the end game. Um, of course, black does not want to trade queens. Uh, queen B5 attacks the knight, keeps initiative. Knight G3. So seems like black has some nice initiative here. White retreats. Absolutely. Check. Now rook e d8. Yeah, I mean, it seems like black is just having more fun. Uh, some idea, maybe some potential idea of rook d2. But it seems like white's also just tied down. D2 also just doubling on the first rank. Yeah, like rook b1. Mm -hmm. Imagine uh, this probably happened at some point. Um, H3, okay, both H6. sides make loof for their kings. Uh, queen e3, and now we see this idea. At first it looks like he's attacking the b-pawn, but I think the, the larger threat is rook d to d1. And white's still being very passive. And it's tough, because white is very tied down. Like, the queen, the rook, and the king, they're all tied down to the knight. Right. But it is hard for black to apply like more pressure from, from this point. I like queen c5. Yeah, pinning the rook, so threatening to, to mm -hmm. take on f1. Um, now king h2, so getting out of the pin. 
Okay, so Mikov trying to, to hold his own. And again, defending f1. Ah, so queen takes f2, so he willingly gave away his queen. Yeah, very intentional sacrifice. Wow. But was this necessary? Let's just... I mean... Um, well, some... it's very concrete. Whoa, game is over. Black won. Black won. Wow, so maybe... So he, it was concrete. Like just Black maybe just calculated until the end and realized there's just a forcing continuation. So there's knight takes e4 looming. There's also knight h5 ideas looming. Right, this mating threat. Um, and the queen is limited on squares. So queen d4, let's just see how the game wrapped up. Whoa, patient move. I like this move. Rook e1, just threatening this, and then eventually mating. Wow. And white would like to like move the g-pawn, but then there's rook e2 ideas. So h4, trying to create some escape route. This beautiful mating net. Like rook h1 is so hard to stop. Yeah, excellent coordination. And h5, so so simple. <laughs> yeah, just this, take this away the square. This never works for the king, like trying to get out. <laughs> yeah, because black just controls these squares. Rook h1 is still a threat. Play g4, just desperate last ditch effort. Uh, but now rook e2, just so restrictive. It's so nice, threatening rook f3 mate. It's a great example of mating that. And now final move of the game f5 Oof. controlling g4 oh wow last several moves they weren't checks they were just kind of restricting like kind of slowly suffocating the the white king yeah this was a very nice game by by justin paul great great yeah. upset win i'm curious how far he calculated if he um like when he sacrificed his queen mm -hmm. if he well let's go back to that this, moment this far it's not the easiest line to calculate where it's not necessarily like super forcing moves. Yeah, I was also just very surprised because, I mean, black has all this pressure and, mm -hmm. and white doesn't really have many threats. Maybe queen f5 check is, is a potential threat. I'm not I'm not sure. I think it is because then g6, you take the knight. So, okay, there seems to be some, some rush here. It feels like black should have some options, but yeah, mm -hmm. he just goes for this queen sack. I'm guessing he basically realized that he's going to be taking the e4 pawn with the knight. Yeah. So once he once he figured out that the rook is getting to e1, knight is taking on e4, knight on e4 controls the g3 square, white's mm -hmm. king. Once he sees this mating net, then I think it becomes a lot more uh, effective and, and a lot more realistic that black is actually winning this. Why can't he start with knight takes e4 and then take, and then take the uh, So knight takes e4 first allows queen f5 check. Queen f5. And then, then white starts counter punching and probably don't want to seven. give away so many... Yeah, and already yeah. it's a completely different position. And white is probably not worse. Yeah, it was important to keep the initiative. I feel like queen takes f2 is a type of move like you, you consider first. If it works, you just go for it. Like there's no need to right. look at other options, especially if white has this threat. You don't want to look at more like defensive options. Um, beautiful finish. That's a nice yeah. upset. Good. And it's not easy to sack a queen against the GM without mm -hmm. like force mate. I mean, he had to make a lot of quiet moves, but he he just correctly evaluated his pieces are going to be stronger. Mm -hmm. So, really instructive stuff. Yeah, it's like what what is the worth of this rook exactly on a8? And it's a great example. Um, this has been a theme in some of the other games too, of valuing piece activity over material. In this case, it was a grandmaster grabbing a pawn on the A-file, starting with uh, this move rook takes A7, where like at first it seemed like white was winning a pawn, but then like as play unfolded, black just had so much activity, so mm -hmm. much initiative, and so many of black's moves, starting with queen E5, were threats. Yeah, maybe objectively not bad for white, but clearly the position ended up a lot easier for black to play with the initiative. Yeah, just, just better pieces, and white lacked like good coordination and just black kept the pressure it's a nice game yeah very nice okay another candidate for game of the day yeah and this big puts, candidate it's going to be hard to <laughs> beat this one yeah i mean this puts justin paul what at six out of seven having an amazing tournament yeah so he breaks out to six he'll be playing another gm next round right uh in the meantime we can get back to this uh burnett uh dragon game this one looks like it's nearing its completion Trying to find that game. Uh, board three. I keep going to the Burns game on board 11. <laughs> okay. Board three. Ah, this game is over. Camille. Uh, the game is just over, yeah. Camille won. 
Uh, just going back a little bit, um, I mean, we we liked his position earlier. I think we left around around here where Black had a lot of pressure, and I was drawing arrows earlier for this rook coming in, um, and Black attacking along the G file. Seems that that was played. Um, it's a nice kind of uh, maneuver to essentially uncastle where you you bring your king towards the center. And uh, there's just so much pressure now. Um, 95 takes, takes. And you won't believe, but the Gareev game has ended in Whoa. a draw. In a draw, Surprise no. Surprise repetition, yeah. So Surprise, no, that's, yeah, we'll, that can't happen. We should happen. finish with this one, but then we'll we'll check out that game as well. So put them back in the playing room and make them play it out. Yeah, especially just for our entertainment. Because after the game is over, the, the Lee Chess engine like quickly analyzes it. Oh, and it's giving I see, Black I see the valuation there. Huge, yeah. huge plus, yeah. minus three for this attack. So it seems like Stuart's probably missed some opportunities. Mm -hmm. Um. But just, okay, so yeah, let's see finish the finish this of this one. game. I mean, this knight seemed like it never escaped from, from h1. And it's just so passive, yeah. defending g3. Uh, now the queen comes in. It's nice that black is just attacking from all directions, like using the queen side, having pressure on the king right. side, knight in the center. Um, doesn't even need the bishop. Sure, maybe at some point there could be bishop a6 ideas still. Yeah. Queen c3, nice move. Black infiltrates. Rook takes g3. Oh, very nice. So giving the knight some life, but uh, okay, just winning the queen. That's a yeah. nice fork. It's nice that you, you actually don't want the knight here because it defends f2. So you deflect it and then just easy win. Mm -hmm. Nice finish. Nice win by Dragoon. He moves on to six out of seven as well. Mm -hmm. So with the draw on board too, that means there's going to be no one on six and a half. Huge tie with six out of seven for, for all of these players. Now we should look at the Gureyev game. Yeah, let's see what happened here. Because we were, I mean, we were really admiring Swirtz's play. Like he, I guess he got like the ideal Pillsbury setup and he had no idea what to do next. Yeah. And just agreed to a draw. Was it repetition though? It was a repetition. Aha. Uh -huh. And we were talking earlier about like how many moves this knight would stay on e4. And I guess no one predicted until the end of the game. Yeah. But but yeah, it may have been four was, moves, so maybe we were moves. close. Yeah, yeah. Very accurate. So white did go for this like four. king h1, knight g1 idea. I got it exactly right. And bishop c8, knight g1. Oh, that's so unfortunate. So this is where they repeat it. So, so basically, I think white was definitely forced to go for this repetition. But black was not, because after the move, knight g1, queen h6, knight e2, this is the moment where black could play something else. Uh, now, the engine on, on Lee Chess is giving an uh, amazing resource here, knight takes g3. Mm. The idea, knight takes g3 from white, and then black goes f4. Okay, this is very engine-like. Just to give yeah. away a piece. And Just giving like, a piece, f4. It's not f4. super clear, but okay, e3 is hanging. I guess, yeah, you attack up. the knight, and then... Oh, you, you want to take on e3 with the pawn, yeah. I mean, yeah, you're going to open up the diagonal again. So certainly not easy to evaluate this with, like, a few minutes on your clock, and it's you true. have to make 15 more moves. Um, so, yeah, I, I definitely don't don't blame him for for not seeing this i do feel like black maybe had other options you know maybe didn't have to go for the sacrifice right away what happens after knight f5 let's take a look if we take on f5 and take on e3 oh yeah h2 is not easy to defend and there's like h3 but there's h3 and like knight e4 might be just devastating e4 takes and like rook f5 maybe you're just sacking you're sacking everything yeah i'm really working, hoping this works of. but we'll see uh, <laughs> e5? much easier i mean you're, it's like sack everything it might be mate i guess you you're threatening mate in two yeah i mean so rook i have to play e5 or maybe e5 yeah wait rook f oh rook f5 also looks pop okay i'll i'll just take the free rook you take on h3 right mm -hmm. king g1 and um, I don't know, maybe... Oh, you can win back a lot of stuff. Yeah, a lot of options here for black. There's bishop g3. Oh, but then maybe I, I just... Oh, I take on g5. Yeah, bishop g3, but... Okay, even rook takes e4 is possible. 
Yeah, it's the type of position an engine just crunches through and just spits out like yeah, black just gives you an wing, answer yeah. immediately. <laughs> um, but to evaluate this with a little time, it's it's really not easy. No, very very. I mean, even for like super GM, just it's just not enough time to calculate mm -hmm. things out. And I mean, going for something like this, you know, you might win, you you might easily lose, and it's a lot of risk. Um, and especially the tournament situation. I mean, a draw. I mean, still you're tied for first. And you're not uh, like a losing losing in this game puts you far behind the rest of the field. So yeah. oh, I just realized sense. looking at this position, maybe Knight H5 was much stronger than Knight H5. Uh, Knight H5 threatening the the triple fork. Yeah, the fork knight. As well as just Bishop is hanging on F5. Ooh, yeah, that looks pretty devastating actually. These dark squares are weak. This bishop not really helping out. Yeah, it's just not even on the board. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, white's down like a few pieces here. So a bit of a, yeah, kind of an anticlimactic finish, mm -hmm. but what can you do? So there's going to be a lot of players tied for first place with six out of seven. Yeah. Um, like even, I wonder how deep the five pointers go. If we go back to the standings, switch scenes here. Because um, the top four drew. John Fedorowicz also took a buy, so that makes him go to six. He's on six. And then the five pointers, it's basically sixth place through 23rd place. Right. Um, Andrew Tang beat Burns. So. Uh, Andrew Tang's the first player with four and a half, so he's the one. So actually, we are looking at basically all the players right. who have potential to be tied for first. And really, any decisive game after the first two boards, the winner would, uh, right. would jump to, to six out of seven and yeah. be tied for first. So who have the winners been so far? Dragoon uh, won his game. Yeah, Elshan won uh, his Mordiabadi. game. Mordiabadi. Mikov lost. Okay, so uh, Justin Paul tied for first. Yeah. Um, and he could be the lowest rated player tied Likely for first. Mm -hmm. um, now we should take a look at the other games because um, I think we should I mean, go to the Mikulevsky be... game because this one is in the end game. And, yeah, let's go um, back here. Probably won't finish soon, but um, is looking good for white. Mm. Uh, so this is where with the Catalan earlier, where right. yeah, it was a, like a whole kind of weird attacking position for white, but now it's simplified to an end game. Uh, it seems like this pawn is just a goner. Yeah, white was already up one pawn. Now it'll be two. Okay, black will get knight g4. But knight mm -hmm. endgames, very famously, uh, like king and pawn endgames. So when you're up a very clean pawn in a king and pawn endgame, you're usually doing very well. In knight endgame, I, I think it's also good. So I'd imagine we could get something like king takes c3 here, knight g4, king d4. Wait, 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 wait. King. Uh, after knight g4, knight oh, f1. Just defending everything. The yeah, defensive even... fork. And white's just up two yeah, pawns. Actually, I think this knight is, on g4 is kind of trapped. Too. And the knight's yeah, yeah. How does the knight escape? Like white just wants to lock the king. In. Yeah, so this is actually much worse than it looks at first glance. Yeah, I think this game is just over. Mm -hmm. um, like two pawns, it's way more than enough. And with with enough time, like players are reaching move forty. Um, yeah, maybe he's just making sure. Like this knight can't be too annoying. Like, make sure you calculate knight d1. But you guys check out the yeah, yeah. So let's move on from this game because it's not. Yeah, Mikulevsky uh, very likely to win and very one-sided. Tied yeah. for the the first place. So yeah, moving on, we have a request to look at uh, Vayam Vidarthi against uh, Bryce Tiglan. Mm. Um, it's a game we took a look at. A while earlier, yeah, and, uh, out of the came opening. from this London system. Now it's heating up. We have a white pawn on g6. Black just playing e6, attacking the queen. Um, another one of these positions makes my head hurt. There's so much tension, a lot to calculate. Um, but probably the queen has to move. Yeah, maybe we could just go back three moves just to show sure. people how this happened. So basically, white played. So white going for this kingside pawn storm, which is double edge because yeah, like, this king's on h1, so it's lacking shelter. Uh, so black played queen d7, white played e5, wow. So he's just going for it with this one. So queen d7 kind of walked into a pin, uh, and white's trying to exploit that. 
It's an interesting idea. Yeah. Because this forces a bishop to remove itself from f6, and then white's opening f file with three attackers against f7. Right. Um, but this e6 move is pretty nifty because it Very nice obstructs the queen from attacking. It also defends f7 with the black queen. White has no time to take on f7 because queen takes rook. This queen's still hanging. Black's winning material here. And after white's queen moves back. C4. No, it won't work. It doesn't uh, quite work. Queen I think F3 the queen check at the end there. So the queen probably moves back to a square like F3. I think he has to. But and yeah, then, very nice find for black. Yeah, very nice. It's like one of these kind of invisible intermediate moves when you're when you're white and you calculate until this position, you think you, you've got them. But like E6, it's it's nice kind of multi-purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and the nice thing is after, like, wherever the queen retreats, black can take with the h-pawn, and then the h-file is half open. And h3 is a bit backwards, ideas of rook h8. And it seems like black's very solid, like this knight is out of play. Yeah, this bishop's bishop very nicely so placed. Normally, like, okay, bishops are good from afar, and knights are good if they're, like, on the outpost in the center. Here, it's the bishop that has the outpost, and it's just, mm -hmm. like, totally, totally dominate. I mean, all of black's pieces here just seem superior to, to white's. I mean, if you're white, though, you're, you are looking for knight maneuvers like knight d2 to e4 to try and get the knight closer to the king side where, where all the action is taking place. Um, but there's ideas for black like rook f4. It just seems a lot more enjoyable for black. Yeah. So white is thinking here like where to put the queen, but um, yeah, I do like black's chances to, to win this, this position. It reminds me of this famous Fisher game that he won with black and the knight or I'm trying to remember against... Who it was? Mm, I think it was someone, maybe Bent Larson, maybe mm -hmm. Banco, someone like this. I don't know. Maybe someone in the chat can can figure out what game I'm thinking of and then let me know. It's I'm, I'm very me bad with while. like historical games, yeah. so I would not be um, able to help out that much. It's this famous game that ends with like this like very nice rook takes a two sacrifice. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, or maybe some not a sacrifice. Back rank rook, mates idea. Plays or rook no? a two. I think he plays rook takes c three at some point. Uh -huh. mm. And yeah, just kind of like a perfect perfect knight or. But okay, I'm not going to be able to uh, to recall. So we should just just move on. So okay, if, if we predict that Bryce wins this game, he'll also be tied for first. That's right. And um, yeah, it seems like a good number of these games are going to be decisive, meaning there will be a lot of people tied for uh, for first place. I do want to look at a game that we really haven't looked at beyond the opening, um, the fight between Emily Yuan and Shabalov, which came from a Benoni structure, um, the, the G3 Benoni. It's transformed a little bit. Um, current position is very close. And Shabalov playing with the black piece is probably just playing for a win, being the higher rate player. Um, he, he was the one who went for maybe a more, um, more imbalanced opening. Mm -hmm. And current position, I like white's face advantage. I like this pawn on d5. It's just defended past pawn. These bishops are completely out of play. Oh, yeah, the game ended. Wow. Yeah, we see the result here. Should really check the results. Yeah, some, they just sneak um, up on you sometimes, you know? It's... Yeah, you, you wouldn't expect this position to just end. You think there's so much more fight left. But as you were saying that white is better, then the, suddenly the draw first starts to make sense. Because <laughs> <laughs> Shapovalov is the higher rated player. It's, it's pretty clear that he offered the draw and, um, yeah, and okay, maybe we, felt a bit worse. We were talking about how he's like super good at open tournaments. He's always mm -hmm. playing for the win. Here, I guess he felt like he's just falling into a strategically worse position, and right. he knows his opponent is in great form. She just tied for first in the Dinker tournament. That's true. He didn't want to keep the you know, look at this position before it, it got much worse. It's a little surprising. I mean, there's certainly a lot of play left. Black could try to put the knight on d6, and uh, I mean, but yeah, these bishops on g6 and g7 don't don't strike me as being uh, yeah. so healthy. I was imagining some idea for black, like c4 and eventually b5 and bring the knight to c5. Yeah. Like the, the typical Benoni improvement where you, you try and create this bind on the queen side. Could but be, um, um, 
I mean, it seems like white has things under yeah. control and just just easier to play, especially with just the bishops out of play. Mm -hmm. Put the pawn there, yeah. Yeah, and so, I'm not a Benoni player, but I I just know the structure can't uh, can't be desirable for black. Um, so if we move on to, I mean, what's another game that? Yeah, a lot of games have, have started to to finish up. I mean, um, we can go down to our our multi board view and see what's up. Um, make sure playing is checked. There, there's only two more games underway. I do have the game on board twelve? Which looks like is um, oh, it's already over, and Barcenia has won. Yeah, so unfortunately the viewers can't see below. I wonder if I can make this full window. Not quite. Uh, so let's go back to this view. And yeah, so just the Bryce Tiglon game and the Mikulevsky game are the only games still underway. Um, Mikulevsky game, I think we, we, we've called it that should be pretty easily winning. Should be winning for a So that leaves us with the final game between Vayam Vidyarthi and, uh, and Bryce, which we really like for black, but it's, um, I mean, if we compare this to the Mikulevsky game, I think there's a, a bit more hope for the, um, the player who's, who's worse in this position. But not white. much, to be honest. I feel like it just looks really, really, just like black. Oh, is black? Everything. Is black up two pawns? Wait, what's just, the? Just one. I oh, think. just one pawn. I can't count. Yeah. 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 So if we go back to position where he played e6, the queen was under attack. Oh, queen takes e5 check. So I think when the dust settles, black is just up the exchange. Um, I mean, maybe there's some argument, like black's structure is a bit weird, but I mean, this should be a pretty clean yeah, technical win. Yeah, rook is win. too strong here. I was wanting to put yeah. rook off and get that d pawn, put my knight on d4. Yeah, you want to win this pawn, but I think there's a lot of cases where king f6 can be played, even e4 could be played. And it can be supported. B4 coming. A lot of worries for white. Um, yeah, in, in practice, this, this shouldn't be too difficult. Uh, and then there, there was an interesting kind of line, too, where if white tries to take the rook and recapture the queen next, there's queen f3 check. It's yeah, important to killer. see these in between moves. Yeah, that, that's what I so I'm sure he took his time to like check out these scenarios decided that uh, okay, his best chance is just to retreat the queen. Mm -hmm. um, and now h takes g6. And yeah, the pawn, I mean, one very healthy pawn island. The king is safe. Yeah, such really hard to get through to the king. And uh, this is move 41, meaning the players could spend, I mean, the players receive how much additional time? Half hour or one hour? 30. 30, 30 minutes. minutes okay so not a lot of time um yeah the position just feels so i don't know rotten for white just it's like the dark square mm -hmm. bishop is so strong open h file so you have rook h8 then the g4 pawn is potentially hanging you know you can play rook h8 rook h4 and then take on g4 mm -hmm. for example and this nice. is already and if the queen leaves this diagonal then there's going to be queen b7 ideas queen you know c6 on this getting on this diagonal oh just no threats for white it's hard to. Uh, That's a dream position for Black. Yeah, I mean, basically, it's just up to Bryce here to to convert it. You know, if, if it seems like he's he's in excellent form this week, so I think he'll have no problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just a matter of finding the breakthrough without without allowing any kind of counter chances, which I, I think will not be too difficult for for Black here. Mm -hmm. So yeah, some it's interesting because yeah. some some games have the ratings displayed, but with some players the ratings aren't displayed. I believe these are U.S. ratings, and right. not FIDE ratings. U.S. ratings. Um, Vidyarth, he's around twenty one fifty, I think, maybe higher. Yeah, we can always check the the standings and see um, just the ratings of the players. So Vidyarthi is rated just over twenty two hundred uh, U.S. rated, 
And we should note there's, uh, there's a mixed doubles competition too. We see uh, in this team column, um, there is kind of the, and th th there's actually a few different team prizes as, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. There's sibling prizes um, for best uh, sibling team. I think there's like father son. There can be, yeah. For father daughter prizes. And student coach, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Student coach, um, nice. And just male, female. Ah, so you're bringing this up to say that Viom and his sister Omia currently leading mm. the mix. I think that's a very dangerous team, yeah, as, uh, as siblings. I think the, the one rule is uh, the average rating has to be below 2200. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we can see like all the teams here. So yeah, the Vidyarthis is. Um, and there's not too many brother sister. I guess there there are four brother sister combinations. Yeah, the strongest they're, they're doing very well. Brother sister combination is not playing, and that's Ru Feng Li and his sister Rachel Lee. Oh yeah, and that's that's a good point. It's, I think they're they're yeah. no longer falling under the average rating because now Rachel is about she's 2, over two thousand. Yeah. Like over twenty six hundred. Right. But there was a stretch where they were just winning everything. But they're both just incredible. Yeah, that's talented. a scary team for sure. Oh yeah. Um, so we have okay. So there's others. Oh, there's a husband-wife team. Mm -hmm. this, this is the only husband-wife team. The Hoffmans. Um, there's mother-son team. It's a nice combination. Have you ever been part of like a mixed doubles team? Maybe once, but yeah, I usually don't don't worry about it too much. I just try to focus on the tournament itself. So the first time I ever had a mixed doubles partner was. I think it was the U.S. Open 2015. It was in Arizona. I didn't have a partner like going into the event. So before the first round started, mm -hmm. I was looking through the pairings list, just trying to find any female player who would be my partner, and like going up to just random random players. And um, eventually, I, I found someone. It was like a 10 or 11 year old girl in a full like Pikachu costume. <laughs> um, rated maybe 800 um, and she agreed to be my partner nice. it helped saying that okay I'm an IM rating is over 2400 um, and then we went on to win I think it was like third like some tie for third place hey, not bad. Um, but in the final round of the tournament she was playing a 1200 and I helped her prepare for the game I found <laughs> the name of her opponent online found uh, her opponent's chess.com profile Found what openings they played, wow. prepared her the, for the first like ten to fifteen moves in some like kind of Italian opening, and she played solidly. She played exactly what I told her. She drew the game, and that that gave us just enough points to win like fifty bucks. Wow! So <laughs> some good memories, <laughs> but it helps to uh, helps to prepare. Yeah, I don't think we have a picture because wow. we. I mean, it's it was still individual. We were playing separately. Um, but it's still great to kind of get that uh, extra prize at the end. So, um, is there much more to talk about? I mean, or? Yeah, basically we have these two games left. So let's just recap and then, yeah, maybe we, we can wrap up the show for, for the day. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of running out of action. So Mikulevsky, uh, or you're on the Tiglon game, that's fine. Uh, Tiglon seems to be doing quite well. Extra pawn, great position. Uh, we, we have a couple moves since last time, knight f3, bishop f6. Queen g3 and e5. Yeah, just He's go just back to pushing moment. forward. Also, potentially setting up uh, again rook h8 um, and uh, rook takes g4. Yeah, this g4 pawn um, is a nice target. But okay, at least now white can put the king on g2 to deal with this threat, so maybe black shouldn't rush with, with rook h8 until it's actually uh, stronger. Mm hmm. And yeah, basically we are expecting Bryce to to figure this one out and, and just convert because again, so many advantages here: better king, better pieces, extra pawn, uh, better rating, more time. I mean, pretty much everything you can ask for in a game. Uh, and then we have the Mikalevsky game. He's trying to convert uh, this uh, knight end game. Um, and you know, actually. Interestingly enough, he didn't play your move knight f1, uh, which I'm, I'm shocked by. I was so happy to find knight f1, just such a solid defensive move. But maybe he, he just calculated the fact that his king will run in and this knight is stuck. Yeah, maybe he didn't like some h6 or f6 or something. I'm not exactly sure, but yeah, he decides to just centralize the king. 
And um, now I'm not sure where he's going with this king f3. And if you move back to g2, the knight comes back to g4. And is there the chance to play knight f5? The knight f5 defends the pawn and threatens king g3 mm. to trap the knight. Okay. If king e6, you have e4. Wow. I think the knight's still stuck. Very interesting. And then f6 maybe, we're just playing king g3. King g3. And looks like... And it's possible he just saw all of this like uh, when he decided to, to give away the, the h-pawn. Yeah, or at least felt like, okay, great chances of, of trapping the knight for sure. Right. Um, so last, the current position is after knight h2 check, so I guess here he's maybe rechecking his calculation. Maybe he wants to... Uh, play king g2 or he might come back to king f4 he might change his mind for sure yeah it looks i mean i don't see any escape for uh for black um originally i was thinking that white would want to play knight f1 idea of king g3 but that allows something like f5 or h5 mm -hmm. and uh the knight would be rescued so the beauty in playing knight f5 first is you prevent you essentially, with one move, you prevent both of these pawn moves. So there's no rescuers. And then, okay, e e4 just solidifies everything. And uh, yeah, it just seems like game over. Yeah. We, we always have to keep an eye on the results to make sure it doesn't sneak past us. The game hasn't already finished. Okay, so what are we left with on the day? We had the, the top two boards uh, going into the round. All players had five and a half. Mm -hmm. Everyone drew. I would yeah. say I one mean, of one, the games was decided more One very peaceful draw <laughs> and one very violent and the other. but abrupt kind of finish. Mm -hmm. Then we had a lot of decisive games on, on the next boards yeah. with a lot of players catching up. To a lot of instructive place, games too. Out of seven. Yeah, a lot of interesting imbalances, absolutely. some nice kind of attacking buildups, nice games where players give away material but capitalize on, on initiative and peace play. Um, Going forward here, really liked Alshon's game. Very clean. Just this this e4 move, so so nice. Yeah. Um, Justin Paul with the b biggest upset of the round, mm -hmm. amazing mating net. Is certainly a candidate for for game of the day. I mean, seeing as how the games are, are basically over, I might get a few more games from from John Hartman because he's been inputting mm -hmm. them. But right now, yeah, th this is a top contender for the game of the day prize. I mean. A well executed game with this queen sacrifice and mm -hmm. also of course the, the sporting elements sure. are super interesting with a huge huge upset um i mean honestly like as the round was going i thought the game of the day was going to be the the gray of uh Swirts game it was very close but um if it just continued. i mean if it, if it didn't end <laughs> like in such an abrupt draw it could have been so beautiful yeah but uh yeah this, this game's certainly a candidate now let me ask you of all the games we've looked at, what was the best move that we've seen this round? Oh, One that's a, best move. That's a good question. Okay, let's let's try to think. What was the best move of the day? Well, I have a move in mind. Also, the chat can like participate in this. If, yeah, if there's if a move that pops out at you, particular move. I, I mean, queen takes f2 is the immediate choice from Justin Paul. Sure. The, the going for the, the actual queen, queen sacrifice. Set. Apart from this one, just um, to replay this in slow what motion. Was I really impressed. Queen by? takes f2. I mean, although he didn't follow it up, I, I was also a huge fan of um, Schwartz's uh, G5 move. I was going to say this. I think Probably G5 was incredible. The move of the round. Yeah. I, I was telling you this on break, but uh, my personal Twitch channel, I have an emote for G5. It's G, <laughs> G5 double X slam. Nice. And even when it's not a good move, I sometimes still like to play it. Because there's one viewer who always gives me bits when I play G5. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, going going to that moment just for anyone who missed it, um, it was I mean very deep move where you just leave the knight attacked. Uh, let me see if I can find it. If we go back because um, the knight on e four just stayed there for uh, for so long. Yeah, g five in this position was was really cool. Yeah, just leaving the knight on e four. Yeah. And um, I mean, he was willing to sacrifice it for the rest of the game. The problem is the game just didn't last very long. It ended in a repetition, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, a lot of a lot of chess left left unplayed in this one. But that happens sometimes. Some of the best moves in history weren't played on the board. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
But uh, okay, yeah. And for those of you that are in interested, I would I would definitely recommend actually analyzing that game. And uh, yeah, Maddie uh, Perrine in the chat is pointing out that basically, according to the engine, Black is just winning uh, in the in the position where they, they agree to a draw, something like minus three or minus four. But I wonder if, if we could have concluded that if uh, if if the analysis like didn't pop up, mm. um, if we would conclude that black's just completely winning i, I doubt it but, i mean it's clear that yeah. black had chances but yeah mm -hmm. to a human it, it never looks clear this kind of position All right um well okay I, yeah i bet Gureyev, no way he repeats with black in that situation i think he yeah he, he, he would knew. have to go for it yeah but uh, it depends on the time situation too if you're like very low on time, and you don't want to risk over pushing. Um, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's of course sad for like the viewers and the commentators to just see a position like this end in repetition, where there's so much fireworks left to uh, to witness. Yeah, yeah, an anticlimactic to to say the least. Yeah. So, um, okay, I think we should start wrapping up. We'll the wrap show. up. Yeah, it's late. It's eleven eighteen p.m. Eastern time. Um, I would imagine that. Some people watching are tired and want to sleep. Um, and tomorrow there's going to be another full round of chess yeah, we'll starting be, at 7 p.m. We'll Eastern time. Doing this for yeah the next two rounds, yeah. uh, same time. Uh, the final round will be earlier, 3 I thought it was 3, but yeah, I think. 3 p.m. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so we'll we can still sleep in like a coverage. little bit. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, and tomorrow, actually, there's a side event. It's a very popular side event at U.S. Open. It's the Blitz Championships. Mm. And I'm debating whether to play in that. Um, people can find out a lot more information on the website. If you go to uschess.org, um, you can find links to U.S. Open. Um, you can also just click the link in the chat. It will give you all information on standings, players, side events and uh, and more yeah thanks so much to everyone who was uh watching in, in the twitch chat our live audience as well keeping us company it was, it was fun driving the conversation at certain points asking good questions um once again guys if you would like to support the show there are options to donate directly to us chess us chess is a nonprofit. they seem like a huge corporation but they are a nonprofit, and their main goal is basically to spread chess to uh, as many corners of the united states as possible uh, and so all uh, proceeds are, I believe, um, Pete said, uh, tax deductible, which mm -hmm. is uh, pretty cool. And uh, yeah, if you like our stream, you want to let US Chess know, then uh, do send them a donation and make sure to mention us by name as your reason for doing so. That would be uh, <laughs> that would be the best. And thanks to the one person who actually donated uh, Esoteric, Esoteric, first yeah. ever Twitch donation on US Chess. Nice, nice. We'll have to have a leaderboard set up soon. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Get that going. Oh, nice. Mm. $2,000 in a five-hour session. Wow. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm sure donating will be a lot more competitive once people get drawn in. But uh, I think it's time for food and then eventually sleep. So as we're signing off, and we'll see you guys again tomorrow, 7 p.m. Stay tuned. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs>